we were moved into the Short Creek area and put into the Bishop of Short Creek, which was Fred Jessup. We were put into his home. Warren's brother? No, Fred Jessup is not Warren's brother at all. Oh, okay. Fred Jessup was one of the original founding um, fathers of the Short Creek area. He had been the bishop of the area for quite a long while, and he had a lot of loyalty and appreciation from the congregation down in Short Creek because he had been there helping them build and caring for the people for a long time. Fred Jessup was interesting in that he could not have children of his own, and he had become kind of the collection point for all of the women who had their husbands taken away. And when I came into his mm. home, he had a large family. He had almost 20 wives by that point and over 60 kids that were under his roof. But every single one of those kids came from broken homes and broken families. So it created a very difficult and hard climate within the home because you had a lot of kids that didn't have a lot of answers and trying to to navigate that was really difficult. For me personally, losing my dad was so hard because I had a view of a lot of love and appreciation for my dad. I know a lot of my other siblings have a different view of him, but for me, that was my perspective. I really loved my dad and I cared so deeply for him. So to have him taken away with never knowing whether we were gonna go back, but then having the community in Short Creek really pushing this narrative, you know, you're never going back to your dad. And ultimately my mother married Fred as a wife. And so we became Fred's children. And from that point forward, the way that the FLDS would promote the belief was that the minute the priest had rearranged a family or a woman was taken from one man to be given to another man, Everything would change for those children. Their their um, ancestral background would change. Their last names would change. Even to such a point that I was told that my very DNA was going to change to mirror that of Fred Jessup. And um, that I was to forget my dad severely. We weren't allowed to communicate with him. We weren't allowed to talk to him. I didn't know if he knew what was going on. And... I knew nothing about what was happening to him. Did you say you were taught that your DNA would change to be his DNA? Did you just say that? Yes. That's what I was told is that after my mother was married to Fred Jessup, that everything was going to change. I was Fred's child now, mm. even to such a point that my DNA would change. Wow. I know it's a bizarre thing to say now and people are like, really? But that's the, the level of illogical concepts that the community was was at throughout my childhood. It's wild. It is, when I think about it now. <laughs> so that, that really changed everything in my story because one, one thing, I lost my family. I also lost my culture of the, short, of the Salt Lake community. And the Short Creek community was quite a bit different. They practiced the belief systems of polygamy and FLDS quite a bit differently than we did in Salt Lake. And also for the Short Creek, they often called Salt Lakers, Lakers. You know, there was always this, you know, you had the Canadians, you had the Lakers and you had the Crickers and whatever congregation you were a part of, that was kind of your label. And so for me to be a Laker moving into a, the land of the Crickers was a really hard thing. Mm -hmm. And to just find my, to find my, my ground with it, you know, Thinking about what Sam talked about, one of the things that stunned me about his description of growing up in Short Creek was that the families didn't spend a lot of time together. It, according to Sam, you spent time with your moms and your siblings, but you didn't spend a lot of time with other people's families, at least more and more down the road. I'm thinking about that as one extreme, and then the other extreme is you go into the Alta school with a ton of other kids, knowing a ton of other families, one is a lot more socially engaging, more community, more connected. That would be the Lakers. And then the Crickers, it, I, over time, it would have moved towards being a lot more isolated socially. Was that your experience or were, were the Crickers more 
socially connected when you moved there? The Crickers were definitely more socially connected. There were certain families that did keep to themselves, and I believe that he was a part of the, one of those families that kept to themselves a lot okay. more. But that was what was kind of interesting for me is, is how socially engaged the, the community of Short Creek was, all the way to the point that um, everyone knew everyone's business all the time, oh, okay. as with small, um, organiza small towns or small organizations. Um, and so it was tough because to learn the social nuances of Short Creek was quite difficult for me. Mm. And then also the hierarchy, whether people agree with it or not, there was a hierarchy of families within the Short Creek place. You know, the last name mattered big time for the Short Creek area. And I was not a wall and I was not a Jessup now. I was somewhere in between. And so I had no status socially. Wait, why weren't you a Jessup? Because I was adamantly not going to be a Jessup. There was a, a space and time where I would get into intense disagreements and arguments with other people from Fred's home as well as from the community because I was an adamant defender of my dad. I believed that he was going to mm. get his priesthood back and that ultimately this nightmare was going to go over. I was mm. one of those kids like from a divorced family where I was, I had this version of how it was going to go in my mind and it was going to happen. She resisted being a uh, Jessup. Definitely. Wow. It was, it was really hard for me. I did not buy into it hook, line and sinker. Like we were supposed to buy into it. Makes sense. And the climate in Fred's home was quite hard because I went from a home where I was the oldest girl and I was there taking care of all of my siblings and doing the home tasks to now I was in a home where there was 20 girls between the age of 11 and 17. And it's hard, that's a tough age for girls, mm. especially when you layer on all of the issues that were happening within the community, as well as the lifestyle and the struggles that they were all coming from. And they were all, we all had a shared back and that is that we were, we were struggling and traumatized from the pain of having our families decimated and then being put in the, the situation of being Fred's it's child. Like a foster home, really. A very extreme version of a foster home, yes. Was it all under one roof? Yes, that was the other tough thing, is Fred had a massive house um, right up against the mountains in the Hilldale area, and everyone lived under the same roof. And so it took all of my experiences of living in a polygamous home and just and aggravated all of it because all of it was still very apparent, even in Fred's home. The, the, the struggles, the arguments, the jealousy, the dissension, it was all still very much apparent in Fred's home. And it was kind of hard because I, I look at it now and I wonder if my mother felt like she jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah, because she started all that. Well, I, whether she started it or not, it was, she I went guess I from, shouldn't say that. I take that back. Yeah. No, can. that's okay. I, I think it's a fair, it's a fair point because- that's kind of how my dad looks at it is, is that she started some of this. And so, um, that was the result of it, mm. but I don't think for a second, it's what my mother wanted. Mm. I think she just wanted a better world for her kids and she was following her understanding of what was the righteous thing to do. Mm -hmm. But ultimately it's what created the death. It's what actually initiated the destiny of all of her children because at that point, my life was forever changed and all of her children were set, there was there were things set in motion that were bigger than all of us. And me being moved to Short Creek was the beginning of a new journey for me that was incredibly difficult. And, and I don't know if I could ever do it again, but the ability to, to survive what would the next season of my life was really, it was important to, to have that experience of having my family taken away and being kind of an island all on my own. And that's what it felt like being moved into Fred's home. I, everything that I knew my world had been was shattered and now I was in this new world with all of the same pressures and all of the same struggles, only I felt like I was further down the road than I was in this path to perfection. And all the wives lived under the same roof, all of Fred's wives? Yes, they did. How many again? When my family came in, I'm not sure how many Fred ultimately married because he married quite a few. He was given a lot of wives even after my mother was married, but he had almost 20 when my mother was married. So you had 19 other moms yes. under the same roof. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of little orphan Annie now, like all these sisters that you gained, I'm, I'm guessing there were some nice ones and I'm guessing there were some bullies. 
Yep. <laughs> how, how are you treated by your sisters <clears throat> and brothers? Well, as I was re referencing this concept of Laker and, and Cricker, I already kind of had a niche in my, um, that I was a Laker and there was this commonality with a lot of the people cause they were from, they were born and raised and from short, the short Creek area. Uh, it was hard. It, I'll be, I'll be honest. I learned a lot about the females of the FLDS through that experience of what the realities what were, was like to share a household with a lot of females. And there was a lot of difficulties that, that came from that. Was there some good things? Absolutely. I learned a lot of how to function in the social environments of the FLDS. And there was a lot of really great people that lived in Fred's home and people that to this day I can connect with and I see. And the fascinating thing to me is even though we're worlds away, we still share this common thread of realizing there was a point in our lives where we were brothers and sisters. And that's been the unique example to me of what the resilience looks like for people that have come from this background is we still have these common ties of loyalty and care and the way that we view one another is quite compassionate and I have appreciated it to, to know that even from my experience of living in Fred's home, I gained quite a few really incredible people in my life that I probably wouldn't have had I not experienced it the way that we had. I mean, you're so gracious and wise now, but I'm wondering at the time if you felt bullied and picked on at all and Absolutely, I did. And I'm wondering what if, what are the types of things they would say or do to you as a way to bully you, if you want to share. And that's not to say they're bad people or that we're demeaning them, because everyone's a victim in the system. Absolutely. <clears throat> I see what you're, what you're saying with it. And a lot of that bullying really came from just that, you know. I was not willing to let go of my dad for quite a long while. And I would get in these arguments with some of the girls of, and it was this, you know, you're Fred's child, you're Fred's daughter now. No, I'm not. Even after I was moved to Short Creek, then I was put in eighth grade. Um, I had done my last year in Alt Academy in sixth grade. And then we had done seventh grade at home in Salt Lake. And then I was immediately put into public school down in Short Creek for my eighth grade year. And even as much as the name that they registered me under, they had registered me under Elisa Jessup and I fought that. And it created a lot of problems because I was just supposed to be accepting and submissive. That showed me, if I look at it now, that resistance was, became a theme of my life <laughs> that ultimately led to my survival. But that's mostly what I was bullied for was, I was a little different. I was a little different and I was so unwilling to um, submit to this idea that my dad was out of my life forever. I also had some brothers that were rebellious in the terms of what an, a traditionally righteous and worthy boy should be. Um, and often they were being reprimanded and it kind of bled into other people. You know, if one of my brothers got in trouble, then it showed something about me and everyone's kind of lumped in the same, um, situation as their mothers or the other brothers and sisters. So it was often just me con conflicting with other kids on everything from how I was doing chores or how I was showing up or how we were dressing or praying or not doing these things. And it's also go, it's very difficult to go from three mothers telling you what to do to 20 mothers telling you what to do. And all of them have that same authority. Mm. Wow. Um, I at some point, 20, 2002 happens and the prophecies don't come true. Mm -hmm. I, I want you to just keep going with your chronology, but I want to make sure we... we absolutely, yeah. we can go into it. Uh, well, the year, the millennial um, switched over and I... You know, that was our, 2000. Yes, year 2000. And that was kind of this point where it's like, okay, what's going to happen? Is this going to start the wave of... of um, destructions. I was currently living in Fred's home when that happened. So you were, you were in Shore Creek by 2000. Yes. Okay. And I tell people all the time, <clears throat> the destructions did start in my life <laughs> because everything that I knew mm. and loved the world as I knew it came to a mm. crashing halt and yeah. um, radically changed. It was often tried to be spun to me as, as that was the beginning of you being a part of redeeming Zion. You know, it was always spun in this weird, weird way, but my world did come to an end in the year 
as the turn of the century happened, um, the turn of the millennia, really. And um, but also within the people as a whole, there really started to be this intense push. And as all of the people from Salt Lake were moving into Short Creek, because with the turn of the year 2000, then it was okay. The end of the world didn't come because you, the people have been gifted more time. That was the story. That was the narrative Mm. that Warren was saying, you know, the people have been gifted more time. The people have been gifted more time. So make good use of this time. Cause that is the thing. Like it was such an aha moment for me when you talked about the millennialism of the FLDS church specifically, but of Mormonism and Christianity more generally, it was an aha moment for me when you said that millennialism, the idea of Christ's imminent return, millennialism has always been used to pressure the, the members to be more obedient and to sacrifice more. That was an aha moment for me, and it's so true in your case. But it's just so, it's so fascinating, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses or the LDS Church or the FLDS Church or any of the millennialistic religions, how there's such a history of there being predictions for the end of the earth, the predictions don't come true, and somehow the leaders are able to gain more obedience and more faithfulness when their own predictions fail to come true. Mm -hmm. And so I I never tire of hearing about how everyone's waiting for this prophecy to come true. It doesn't, and it doesn't make everyone go, wow, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's not a prophet. Let's get out of here. Instead, you're more devoted. There was definitely a lot of that. But one thing that started to change is when the, the the instructions didn't come, then there was this kind of climate of like, okay. But a lot of people who had any point of influence started to question a little. And we saw another mm. split happen right around this time where Warren um, reprimanded more men. And particularly we saw a split happen with the community in British Columbia. There was, there's a community right there by Creston, British Columbia that, um, had been there for since the days of Leroy Johnson and the leader, the Bishop of of the, at the time was Winston Blackmore. And one day Warren gets up and he explains that Winston is a false prophet and deals with him greatly as Warren would, would continue to say, but ultimately what it led to was a split happening. And that was a difficult time because there was the same thing that had happened years before. There was families that were split right down the middle. And there was people that followed Winston because they were concerned about what was happening. But then there was people that it just ingrained them deeper. And it's just what you're saying. Because the predictions don't happen, you would think that it would logically help people question. But in reality, what it did is it just ingrained them further. And it was more tools that were used by Warren as to push people even further and deeper into it to clinch more control as things would go on. So by the time that the split had happened within the FLDS right around the year 2000 and the end of the world didn't come, the Olympics are coming and there's this intense pressure on the people. Everyone had moved to Short Creek at this point and it's it's this pressure cooker of, of things that are happening. And as we find in the story, it just keeps getting more and more so that way. It was right around this time that in my own life, then things took a turn much for the worst. But I was sitting in in prayer circle one day with my family in Short Creek and Fred Jessup, who was my father at the time, he alerted me to the fact that I was going to be married. And he had done it in kind of a subtle way. He just put his hand around me and and told me, you know, the, the prophet has a place for you. And it wasn't in a public forum. And so there was a part of me that was a little confused and I was a little bit taken aback because I was 14 years old. I mean, that timing's probably not coincidental. That's when puberty around when puberty happens in a a kind of a cynical mind is like, yeah, as soon as a, a girl becomes of, of kind of post puberty age, she's a candidate for marriage, but I don't want to, I don't want to push that on your story, but that's where my mind goes. 
Well, it's a very fair point because that's very much how it was. You know, they had a saying that if you have a rebellious girl, get her married and get her pregnant and it will solve everything. Mm. And you watch that happen over and over and over in the women's experience that are within the FLDS. And I think because of the, the rebel nature that my older brothers were, because at this point I had another brother who had, I had three brothers that had left the Fred's home. And, um, I think they saw that as a little bit of a threat. I, I, when I tell this story, I'm, I'm often questioning even myself, like what were the reasons? Why did this happen the way that it did? And I think there was a lot of them, but I really do agree that there was a part of it where the, the greatest solution to solve a rebellious girl was just get her married. And there was something about me that was a threat or a concern as to whether I was going to pollute other girls and make them start questioning or thinking for themselves. Mm. I was wondering that when you were talking earlier about how you were like, I don't want to take the Jessup last name. I don't want to, you know what I mean? Like you're having these little, little fight backs, you know, mm -hmm. um, because of love for your father. Um, but to them would seem rebellious, like within the family. So I'm wondering if that's why, cause you said that you had older sisters still, and they skipped the older sisters and, then told you you were going to be married. And I was wondering if that's one of the reasons why like your dad would choose you. I definitely assume that now because of, of how it all laid out. I mean, how it all was, you know, there was, there was a, quite a few girls that were older than me. And that's a tool that I used as the days went on after Fred had told me the, the questions in my mind. And I look back on this and I realized this was the birth of my personal resilience because I do believe that that instinctual part of me that was always present and at the po different points in my life, I was able to keep quieter, easier, really rose up inside of me. And my ability to question was quite an anomaly. And it's one that I'm really, really grateful for because my fight to question is why I'm here today. And this rose up intensely at this t time because I remember going to my mother and saying, I, Fred, Fred just told me I'm getting, I'm getting married. And she even herself was a little confused. She's like, that, that can't be like, we were all kind of in this state of confusion. And so I went and followed up with Fred and said, uh, questioned whether he was talking to the right person. I mean, Fred's late in his eighties at this point in time Holy and quite mother. old. So it's, it's very easy to think maybe he just got it confused with somebody else, which was my impression as this young 14 year old girl I'm like, he's definitely got me confused with somebody else. Can, can I ask quickly, mm -hmm. like, this is important because Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, married at least two 14-year-olds. So we have to first say that this is not, the, the, marriage, the, the marriage of 14-year-old girls to an adult man did not start with Warren Jeffs. It started with Joseph Smith. And so we've covered quite a bit what it must have been like to be a 14-year-old girl and to be told you're going to be marrying some random man who is a decade mm -hmm. or two or more older than you. So, I mean, I, I do want to just understand what's that like to be 14, 14 years old and told you're going to marry some man? Definitely a good question. And I, I <clears throat> tell people, the lens that I view my story on, it's, it's very much like the angles of the sun throughout the day. The further in my journey I go, the angle of my lens and how I view things shifts over time. And I detailed all of this quite extensively in my book, Stolen Innocence. And the value of, of that is I was at a different angle in my life. And I was young. I was 20 when I was writing this book. And you see that. You see how close, how much closer I was to that experience and being able to articulate the feelings around it more effectively than I am today. And for me, I knew that there were young girls married in the church all the time. I knew it. We had stories of all of our ancestors that had married young and we knew that it was just a part of it. We had kind of reached a point in everything where a lot of underage marriages weren't happening nearly as much. So yeah, as Lakers, 
it, it was it normal for a 14 year old girl to be married? No, okay, not as much. And even in my own family, my my youngest sister had I, my older sister had been, I believe, 17, almost 18 when she had got married. And even for my dad, he was like, "That's pretty young." But most of my other sisters were 19 and 20, past their 20s before they had been turned in to be married. But also. If I look back on that, there was also this understanding that the outside world was starting to question some of the practices of the FLDS. And we would have certain men that would come on to um, the, the come to the pulpit on Sundays and would give us updates around maybe some of the legal struggles that the FLDS were up against. And so we knew that there were outside forces in law enforcement and government that were questioning the practice of underage marriage. And they would tell the people about this, that this was one more step of persecution that was being dealt to the people of the FLDS to stop the Lord's will. How many people were going to succumb to this threat? And um, even within my experience, if, if, if you see how it, it ended up happening, you see that the church knew exactly what they were doing. Warren knew exactly that marrying underage girls was wrong and was going to be challenged as time went on. But as a young girl going through it, it was very difficult because that instinctual part of me, I often refer to it as my as spirit. Spirit was very present for me at the time, and it was terrifying. At the beginning, when I was very first told, I thought maybe it was just a little bit of a confusion and that when I alerted Fred that, A, my age reminded him that I was 14, and that he probably had me confused with somebody, that it was going to be all cleared up and I would continue on with my life. Well, it did not happen that way. Fred made it very clear to me that, no, this is you. You are going to get married. And that's when my self-preservation started to kick in. And I don't know exactly why, but there was a part of me that rose up and said, this is not for me. Like there, that, that gut instinct, that feeling on the inside. And I went against the grain, unlike very few women of the FLDS have ever done. And that is, I questioned it severely. <laughs> I went to Fred multiple times and explained where I was coming from, that I, I felt like I wanted at least two more years. I mean, imagine that you have a 14 year old child asking for two more years to be 16 years of age before they get married. And that was my request at the time is I just wanted two more years. I wanted to finish as much school as I could. And I wanted to feel more prepared to be married. <clears throat> um, at the time when Fred alerted me that I was going to get married, they didn't tell me who I was going to marry. And that had been a practice that had recently started to happen within the FLDS that I look back on now and realize it was another form of control because the girls were told they were going to get married, but then they weren't actually told who they were going to get married until right before the actual ceremony. And that was a way to prevent any um, resistance towards it because you're just, it's happening in the moment. After a couple of days, I had, I was really concerned and I had asked my mother if she would start to talk to Fred for me. I was trying to ask Fred, you know, I need to talk to Warren about this because that was the answer I was being giving, given is this is the Lord's will. This is the prophet. This is an arrangement that the prophet has called. And it was kind of being spun in a way where it's like, this is a gift to you. Why can't you be grateful for it? You know, why are you resisting this? This is, this is the next step of your life. And it was really hard as a teenager because socially within the home that I was living in, everyone was trying to get me to be really grateful that this was happening this was the ultimate, ultimate for women within the FLDS. I was really struggling one night and I had come down once again to a prayer circle. I still didn't know who I was going to get married to. And I was still trying to get Fred to give me permission to go talk to Warren. What's a prayer circle? It's, it's just what they do at the end of the day. The family comes together in prayer if it's in the living room, but everyone comes together and it's just the end of the day prayer. That's, that's done. Like 50 people all in yeah, a big circle. All in a big circle and, or just in the same room. It's, it's called the prayer circle or come down to prayers. That's what it was referred to. Now also people don't really, I get this question a lot and I know it's kind of off topic. It's like, how did you all communicate in these big homes? And truly these big homes had intercom systems. 
And so you'd be sitting there in your room and the intercom system would come on and it was like, father's calling everyone to prayer. And you knew what that meant. That meant you go down to your prayer circle. And usually in those prayer circles, it was some families, then the father would read some sort of a scripture, whether that was a sermon or out of the Book of Mormon. So it was more indoctrination that was happening. And then everyone would say the night prayer and then you would go home and go to bed. There was also a prayer circle that would happen first thing in the morning at five or six in the morning in different homes. And so the, the day was bookended with this experience of everyone coming together and getting some sort of a directive from the dad or from the father and then um, saying their prayers. Someday I want to see a reenactment of that visual <laughs> of father and 20 wives and all their children in a single prayer circle. That would be a fascinating one because then it would have to be ended because at the end of prayer circle, you always did the same thing. And that was everyone went through a line and you all shook hands or gave Fred a hug or a kiss. That was just what everyone did. That's father. Yeah, that's father. And everyone went through and you shook his hand and you said goodnight or you gave him a hug or a kiss on the cheek or he would kiss the wives as they come through. So it would be a very fascinating and re enactment of it. He would kiss each wife every night at the end of prayer circle along with all the kids. Sometimes, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and usually that was the only interaction that a wife had with him through the whole day, mm. unless they were called to sleep with him that day. Like they all had their schedules and every family was different. In Fred's home, it was um, Fred would just decide which wife he wanted to sleep with, with him and they would just go rest with him in his room. And I don't know what was done behind closed doors and I haven't really gone deep to find out, but that's just kind of how it was is if you were called to, to stay with him, that's what happened is you just went and stayed with him or, or took care of him. And at this point in Fred's life, he was very frail and the wife's position was more caretaker than wife for him because a lot of his daily care were, were, was done by his wife's. He's in his 80s. He's in his 80s at yeah. this point. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm sitting once again at this prayer circle. I am not in a good mental headspace. And I was getting a lot of pressure from the family because people just wanted me to do what I was told. And it was really, I think subconsciously there was a lot of people It made them very nervous when someone was not doing what they were told to do. And to watch the event happen was quite nerve wracking to a lot of people because they're accustomed to just people doing what they're told. I got a lot of pushback from the girls in the home too, because I think some of them were quite jealous. There was a lot of girls that were questioning why they had been passed over and why I was getting married. And then there was frustration as to why I wouldn't just do it because it was challenging the roles and responsibilities and expectations of the females in the FLDS. The subtle nuances that happened in this story, I, I always give a precursor to people, and that is that in the FLDS, a majority of our lives, the girls and the boys are kept separate. And there's an extensive amount of teaching around keeping separate, don't fraternizing, not looking at each other, not talking to each other. Uh, you know, there's, there was a saying that would say, treat boys, boys treat girls as though they are snakes and girls treat boys as though they are snakes. And so it breeds and it cultivates a lot of like separation between genders within it. And there's not a lot of co-ed anything that really happens. You know, we're put on the same work crews together, but we're given very different roles and responsibilities of what to do. So for me, was it sitting, like you and twenty sisters in bunk beds in a massive room? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming sisters yeah. and brothers slept separately. Absolutely, sisters and brothers <clears throat> slept separately. What was kind of interesting is, is yes, that's normally how it was in Fred's home. But my mother had done something quite unique, and that is that she had really advocated for her children to be close to her. And so for me, I shared a bedroom with two of my younger sisters. And um, we were close to my mother's. But for most of the girls that were in Fred's home, they shared rooms with girls in their same age group. Got it. And so, yes, there was a little bit of both that were happening in, in it. But the girls and the boys slept on different levels of the house completely, on different quadrants of the house completely. And Fred's home, I, I explain it to people, it was a very large hotel at this point. There was over, I believe, like 100 doors in that house. Whoa. It was a huge home. Mm. It would have to be to be able to house that many women and children. Mm. 
M, but it still wasn't nearly as big as Roland Jeff's home in Short Creek. Mm -hmm. And that was only filled with mostly wives. So you can imagine how it was, but very large home. At this, this per circle, I had an empty seat next to me and I was really quite surprised because there was a lot of people in this room and to have an empty chair meant someone was sitting on the floor, especially the mothers. And there was one of Fred's wives that was sitting on the floor next to me. And because of the way that we were trained and taught, you uh, you always respect your elders. You always respect those that are older than you and especially the mothers. And I was like, hey, please come and sit next to me or, or I'll move and you sit here. And there was this really adamant, no, 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 you stay there, you stay there. And in to the room walks my cousin. And he had been working really closely with Fred because one of the things that Fred was often given is he was always given a collection of boys from the community and they were seen as missionaries. And so Fred ran kind of the missionary programs of the community. And so he always had a whole collection of boys up at his home and the, the girls and the mothers were always making food for this collection of boys, but they were always worker bees. They were sent out to go work in the community to do different things. And most of them were, it was unpaid work. Well, I had seen my cousin, his name is Alan, um, quite a bit up at Fred's home. And I really struggled with him because I had known him my entire life. And during the time that my family had been moved to my mother's childhood home, he had also been on the ranch at that time as well. And so I'd gotten to know him a lot better and he'd been quite a bully in my life. And I did not like the way that he made me feel when I was around him. And again, he was your cousin? Yes. How, tell me exactly how he was related. Yes, so my mother and his father are brothers and sisters. So you're first cousins? Yes, we're first cousins. Holy smokes. Yes. He walked you, in this, okay, yeah. he walked into the room and came straight over. And as he's walking, I'm getting this very ominous pit in my stomach and I could not put a finger on as to why. And I was concerned. I was like, okay, well, what is this? And he came and he sat right next to me. And as subtle as that is, it spoke volumes and instantly I mm. knew what this meant. For him to be allowed to come and sit next to me in such a public setting was very, very telling. And immediately I knew, oh my goodness, this is who they're going to have me marry. And I couldn't stop my reaction. I literally just leapt up and fled the room and went running into my mother's room. And just, she came later and found me and I'm just sobbing and explaining in blubbers and mumbles that they're going to make me marry Alan. Like they're going to make me marry Alan. I, I, I'm, I can't marry Alan. Like I can't, I can't marry him. And she, she herself was confused and she invited me and encouraged me to go and talk to Fred about it. Because once again, we were convinced that there was a miscommunication or something wasn't being told, but that, as I said, so much of the social side of the FLDS was also used against people and the act of them not telling me, but instead having me be told in front of everyone, it was layering on one more level of pressure because now everybody already knew and everybody already now had the expectation of what it was going to mean for me. And that's where my push to change what was happening to me really just flared up because I truly, I can still look back at that version of myself as a 14 year old girl. And there was everything inside of me that was screaming, no, everything. And I, I it reignited my, um, my, sh my fight to stop this from happening. And I went later to Fred and I just explained, you know, you're going to have me marry, you're going to have make me marry Alan. And he confirmed, yes, that's who the prophet has, um, directed that you're going to be married. That's the arrangement that the Lord has for you. And I firmly believe, no, this, this, there is something wrong with this. Like this is, and he, he really got, he started to get frustrated with me because this is not the first time that we had had this conversation and about me not wanting to be married. And finally, I just said, I have to hear it from the prophet's mouth. If this is truly the Lord's will, I have to hear it from the prophet's mouth. And I don't, I don't know exactly where that demand came from. It just kind of came up out of me. And even for me, in the moment that it came up and out, I was a little afraid because A, you don't, you very rarely get an audience with the prophet. 
And rarely, never, is it a woman by herself getting an audience with the prophet. She's always connected with a man to do that. But um, Fred told me, well, you're, you're going to have to call Warren and you're going to have to see if he'll see you. And so I did. I took the steps. I took and did whatever was necessary to, to get in front of Warren. You know, I ended up talking to him on the phone and explaining my situation, where I was, how I felt that the Lord, the Lord was telling me through my fasting and my prayer. And what I tell people is, you know, this had been going on for a few days. And from the day that I had found out that I was going to be married, then my mother's response to hard things in life was fast and pray about it. And for a lot of the people of the FLDS, that's how you deal with hard things is you start to fast and pray. And so all of these days leading up to it, I had been fasting and praying and fervently praying that the Lord would hear my would hear my heart or, and would somehow bring me peace around what was happening. Um, so the next, when I finally was able to talk to Warren on the phone and he still directed me, no, this is the Lord's will. And I adamantly, the same thing. I said, I have to hear it from the prophet's mouth. It was very frustrating. I remember feeling that they were so frustrated with me and short and not kind about it at all. But finally was like, well, come and see me in my office then. And I'll never forget the day that he told me to come to his office was a couple of day, a day or so later. And from the moment I got off the phone with him, there was an essence of relief because I finally had been given what I'd been asking for. And that was an audience with the prophet because I truly believed in that moment that the prophet was connected to God. And I believed that God was listening, truly believed that he was listening to my prayers and my requests and the day leading up to my meeting, I didn't sleep a wink and I just spent the entire time, as they would say, on your knees, crying and begging and praying fervently that things would, would change. The, the, the direction of what I was being requested and forced to do would change. And I finally came into my meeting um, with, with Warren and to kind of lay out what this was like. Roland Jeffs has had a massive compound in Short Creek. And just as you come into the town off of the highway that runs through the town, then you see this, this giant home. And that's only the tip of the iceberg because the home just spread over this whole entire complex. And at this point in it, they had taken the compound that they had up in Sandy, Utah, and they had replicated it down in Short Creek. And so the Jeffs family managed and owned an entire street block of houses. And that was the Roland Jeffs compound. And it, at this point, it was gated and walled. And so to even get on there, you had to have... Um, you had to be invited or you had to have permission from all the way up. We also knew that Roland was really ill. And because I had two sisters that were married to Roland, I had a little bit different perspective than most people did and that Warren was a lot sicker than most people knew. He had stopped coming to churches sometimes and he would just, what we were being told as a people was that Warren would come and he would get up to the pulpit and he would say, I speak for my father. I'm here doing my father's will. I am the representation of my father. So this narrative of I am my father, I am my father really started to happen around this time. And this was spring of 2001. Um, coming up to Fred's home, you know, it's a beautiful home, especially for most people of the FLDS. It was, it was the top of the top of the top as far as living conditions. And, you know, they were royalty. They were royalty of our community and the home and their way of life represented that, that um, status within the, the community as a whole. I walked up to the front door and Warren's brother opened up the door and put me in the waiting room. And I was shaking like a leaf because I, something in me knew I was there and it was calling me to be there, but everything about the way that I had been raised and my culture, I was going so absolutely against everything that I had been trained to do. And I had that fear of, Am I truly losing my testimony? Am I truly making a huge mistake that's going to rob me of my ultimate salvation? And it was this, this war that was happening within myself. But every time I would try and imagine my life submitting to what they were told, it would literally make me 
viscerally nauseous. My whole entire body would respond with this very ominous feeling and, and terror, just absolute terror of what that would mean. I finally was called into Warren's office and I am, I'm very, I'm trembling. You know, he had always been a huge figure of authority in my life. I can't tell you the many times that I was called into his office at school for all kinds of, um, all kinds of things and always reprimanded and always, um, used as an example. And so I had a lot of history with Warren of what it meant to be on his bad side, what it meant to be being, um, reprimanded by him. And that would, that would had been kind of the relationship that I had. And so I looked at him as someone to fear and to sit in that room. And if anyone has heard Warren's voice or listened to him, he has such a unique voice and he had this presence about him that just was very off putting. You didn't feel comfortable in Warren's presence. And I, I, I've talked to a lot of people who knew him, who had experiences with him, and they all share the same thing. And there was just something that just kind of rubbed you wrong. The hair on the back of your neck stood up. And I, I think it's that, that primal protection that every human has that's like, run! Um, but He comes across as kind of creepy to, to us, to outsiders. Is that fair, Jen? Yeah, and <laughs> I would especially say when he talks. Like he's already creepy looking, but then when he talks and the way he talks mm -hmm. and articulates his words and like the sound of the words, the monotone, yeah, it's there's just something about it that like even for us on the outside, at least for me, um, I get the same reaction. Mm -hmm. Like like I just like ugh. it just feels wrong and. No, okay. I don't know. Creepy yeah. in some mm -hmm. way. I don't know how, how else to say it, but the yeah, same kind of physical reaction. <laughs> yeah. You get it. Yeah. It, it, but that's just to kind of give listeners this, this idea of, you know, a 14 year old girl and this, this, this man, and he has all authority in my life, really, even though he wasn't the prophet at this point in time, he was the acting prophet. And that was just the truth of what was happening. Um, I, I sat there and I was already so broken. I was emotionally kind of, I was just right on that edge where I had very little left to, to give to the situation. And I just poured my heart out to him and I explained where I was coming from and I was crying and he handed me a box of tissues. And, and he, the more that I talked, the more I could just feel the judgment that was emanating off of him. And that just, he was so displeased with the way that I was, was speaking and talking and the fact that he kept bringing up was, do you really think you know better than the prophet? And it was this layers and layers of shame of trying to get me to question even why I was there. You know, it was this, this feeling of how dare you even be here? And for whatever reason, I still had enough left in me that I just said, I need to hear it from the prophet. I just need to. And if, if, if the prophet tells me to do this, I will do it. But I need to hear it from him. And out of frustration, you could tell, uh, looking back now, I can tell Warren was very frustrated with the circumstances. I'm sure he assumed that he would come in and it would solve the issue and everything would go on. But I was adamant and I was not leaving until then. So he finally granted me to go see him. Ruin. And, Ruin. and he brought me down the hallway to the lunchroom in Roland's home. And I was as familiar with Roland's home because I had had the opportunity to spend some time in there with my sisters who were married to Roland. So I knew kind of the layout of the area and um, it wasn't unfamiliar to me, which probably is why I was able to hold myself together enough is because most people of the FLDS had never even entered Roland's home, let alone been able to, to be there at all. But I had actually shared meals with the family as a guest of my sisters. Roland's sitting at the front of this table and all of his wives and his family are there and they're eating lunch and he's, he's, he's shaking from old age and he's trying to eat. And, um, f Warren brings me over to him and alerts me, alerts Roland to that. I need to talk to him. And I remember this feeling. And I remember one day I saw this picture of, um, this, this painting, this illustration, and it shows Christ and he's sitting and there's a child 
at his knee and he's talking to the child. And I know that the picture is is meant to be this representation of Christ nurturing the child, but that's really how it felt to me as I was sitting at the knee of God. And that illustration often was something that I was able to tie to try to explain what this experience was like for me. And all I could do was just tearfully try and explain. And here you have a man who's hard of hearing and a child who's at his knee at the lunch table begging to not be married. And if nothing else, to please not be married to the man that they told me I was supposed to be married to. And he got this really confused look on his face and he kind of looks up at Warren and Warren just jumps in and proceeds to talk over me and explain to Rulin why I was there. You know, she doesn't believe that that your word and your direction is true. And I, I don't remember all the details of everything he said, but what it made me feel like was that it was completely misrepresenting why I was there. I was there because I wanted to do the prophet's will. I was just wondering if we could wait two years before I had to do this or if we could please ask the Lord if I can marry somebody else. And you could tell Warren, Roland got a little bit like, not frustrated, but it was like, okay. And he ultimately turned back down to me and he patted my hand. And I remember even looking at him and he had food coming out of one side of his mouth and he's still in the middle of chewing his lunch. And he just says, follow your heart, sweetie, follow your heart. And that was it. And in that moment, it was like the weight of the world came off of my shoulders. And I was elated. There, there was this openness and this peace that just flooded over my, my whole entire being. And all of the struggle and all of the, the pain, because my heart was telling me this was not true for me. And his words of follow your heart was exactly what I needed. And I believed that was God speaking to me, wow. that I was in the right, that, that, that I, that this was right for me. And my tears dried up and there was this lightness and this innocence that just came over me where I just wanted to skip down the hall. And I thanked the prophet and I, and I shook his hand and I just felt so absolutely blessed and grateful that I had had an audience with God and that God was listening. And I felt like my prayers were answered. I get up and we're walking down the hall and Warren asked me, okay, what are you going to do? And I just started to blubber on about, I know the Lord has answered my prayers and the, the prophet told me to follow my heart and my, my heart is telling me that this isn't right for me right now, that I, I, it's okay for me to wait until I'm older to get married. And he looks at me and he stops and he tells me my heart is in the wrong place and just goes on to, to explain that this is going to happen. And if I want a place in my community, if I want um, to go home to my mother and to Fred's home, then I was going to get married. And it made me feel as though if I did not get married, then I was not welcome in my my church, I was not welcome in my community, and that I would become an apostate just like my other family. And a lot of the words in the way that he explained it, sometimes my, my memory doesn't remember those, but the feeling was so absolutely crushing. And I walked away from that meeting absolutely deflated because I realized that there was nothing I could do. And even though for me, it was very confusing because I didn't understand why there was a confliction in the message, but that's where Warren spun it as though, this is your problem. Your heart is wrong. You are not enough. If you were, your heart would absolutely be telling you this is the Lord's will. And so I went home and my mother, I remember her gathering me up because I was just a wreck. I was completely broken. And she kept telling me, you know, there's, there's, this is, you know, it's okay for us to do what we're told. It's all going to work out. Maybe there's more to this than we're being, than we see right now. You know, it's this whole concept of faith. You have faith for sacrificing the moment and what feels good right now for faith that it's going to ultimately pay off later and you're going to have a better salvation. 
So she, with my older sister, spent the whole night that night and they crafted the most beautiful handmade wedding dress. And I just sat and watched this process throughout the night as they put together this beautiful dress. Because before this, I had refused to make a dress, even though I'd been pushed multiple times to make myself a wedding dress. I had refused because I wasn't going to get married. I was adamant I was not going to be married. But to watch that and to see the care and the, the love that they crafted into every single stitch of this dress in their way of trying to hand off to me anything that they had to, to give me the strength to just do what I was told. And the next morning I'm standing in this, in this mirror and I have the dress on and my hair is being done up beautifully. And I remember just looking there and, and the thought go through my head of this is what death looks like. And realizing that that's what I wanted is I wanted to die. And I just became numb and just a shell of who I really was and was loaded into a car with my soon to be husband and his family. At this point, it showed me that my mother started to be separated from me because I think they saw that as a concern. So she was told to drive in a different car. And this was a unique time frame too, because of all of the stuff that had been happening in the state of Utah around child marriages and underage marriages, then um, they started to practice where they would drive basically traffic girls and boys across state lines into Nevada, and they would marry them in Nevada because the laws and the age limits were, were less strict in Nevada than they were in Utah. And so by p performing the marriages in Nevada, they would negate what was happening in Utah to try and combat child marriages. And that became evident for me because they drove me and some of the other girls that were from Fred's home who were also going to be married there. I had been, um, there was another young girl who was from Fred's home who was also very young, like myself, her name Ruby. And we had had a lot of common ality in the, the days leading up to our marriage and that we both were really concerned about getting married. I don't know that she had taken it quite as intensely as I had as far as resisting the marriage and saying, no, I don't want to be married. But I knew from our conversations in private that we were both really scared about getting married. And even that day in Caliente, Nevada, there was a hotel that was owned by, actually it was a little rundown motel that was owned by one of the brethren in the community um, then we were sitting in this hotel room at the top of these stairs and they had directed us to get married, to get ready for our wedding. And she's sitting there with me and I'm looking in the mirror as she's trying to help me finish putting my hair together and doing up my dress and getting my shoes on and trying to help me because I know that she could feel how desperately I didn't want this. And it was her way of trying to encourage me. But there came this moment where she just looked at me and she just said, you know, we, we could run. And there was this moment where there was this light inside of me where I'm like, could we run? And the question of, you know, what would happen? And then, of course, there was all of the programming that kicked in and all the reasons why we couldn't run. And, and no, you know, I'm often asked, why didn't you go to the police? Why didn't you get on a bus and go away? Why didn't you do all these, these self-preservation acts? And I often tell people, I'm really glad that there is that option for a lot of the world where we have the option to say, no, we had the option to go to the police. We have the option to run away. But for me, those op none of those options were viable. No, I couldn't even go to my birth father. He wasn't even allowed to talk to me at this time. And he, I later found out that he hadn't been alerted to the fact that I was getting married until long after I had already been married. So th those options that I think a lot of people may be considering that I had, these, those did not exist for women inside of the FLDS. And so there wasn't a way for us to run. But to realize that even in that, that one statement, 
that there was there was another person who was equally as afraid as I was, equally as desiring to not be married as I was. But ultimately, we were told that it's time we it was time for us to go down and get married. And I was brought into this other hotel room that had been cleared out of its bed. And in the place of the bed was chairs. There was a few chairs in the front where Rulin and Warren and Fred were sitting. And then there was chairs where the audience was sitting. And one of the things that a practice that had been done that had recently been changed in the FLDS is families were not invited to weddings. Sometimes even the girl's parents were not invited to the weddings anymore. It was all done secretively. And this was one of them. I kept being told, you should be really grateful that your mother is being allowed to be here. But I didn't have any other family there aside from my mother. And um, it was a very quiet, closed event that was happening. But we walked into this and I started to get this feeling where as numb as I was, there was something inside of me that was still aggravated and at, at, at very much at attention. And I, my, my brain started to go on overdrive of what am I going to do? And I, I held on to this last shred of hope. And the last shred of hope I had at this point in time was in marriage covenants, there's this, there's this section where they say how long you're going to be married to someone. And that is for time and all eternity or for time itself. And we had known that there were some people who had been married for time only because it meant that they were only married for this lifetime, but then in the afterlife, they were going to be married to somebody else. And I remember thinking, please just say time. All right, Lord, I'm going to do your will, but just, just let me be married for time only. Because I cannot imagine an eternity being married to Alan. I, I couldn't imagine it. And I was just over and over and over in my head, please just say time, please just say time. And it came to that pivotal point in the covenants and Warren, who was conducting the marriage ceremony, under the direction of his father, because at this point in time, it's very common for Warren to just speak for his father, you know, and it was always, I speak for my father and the same thing, you know, I'm here at the direction of my father. I am just his feet and his voice and his, his body right now. But he came to that point and he said, time and all eternity. And my heart just fell and I started to cry. It was the last reaction, and I became that innocent, trembling, panicked 14-year-old girl that I was. I wasn't an FLDS girl in that moment. I wasn't uh, an adult. I wasn't anyone that was at all prepared for what was unfolding in front of me. And I just started to sob, and it was loud and it was annoying and I could tell everyone in the room was, was getting really uncomfortable from my sobbing. And Warren just kind of keeps going on with this, this wedding ceremony. And it came to the point where it was time for me to say, I do, to consent to the, this covenant of marriage. And I could not bring myself to speak. And it was like this last defiant act of, of myself that, if I don't consent to it, I don't have to do it. And I just sat there. And the silence in this room was tangible. You could cut it with a knife. And I just sat there, sobbing in silence. And Warren looks at me, and I could see him out of the corner of my eye, but he starts over, and he starts to say all of the covenants again. And he gets to that point again, and I don't speak again. And finally he asked my mother to step up next to me. And my mom steps next to me and she grabs my hand and she just squeezes with every ounce of her strength and just crushes my hand. And it communicated volumes to me. My mother standing next to me, I could just feel her begging through my, through my hand to please don't do this. Please just, just obey. And I realized in that moment that her salvation was on the line and that social pressure and the, the family. But I realized my mother's 
salvation, my salvation, my sister's salvation, my family's salvation, Fred's salvation, the pressure of all of that came to a head for me. And I realized that it was bigger than just me, that nobody was going to stop it. And I finally succumbed to that. And I said, okay, Warren finishes up the ceremony as quick as he can. It comes time for me to, to kiss Alan. And I, I couldn't even, the act of that, I, I couldn't do it. And I just reached over and, and got it over with as quickly as I can, could and just ran from the room and barricaded myself in this bathroom that was kind of adjacent to the area and just collapsed on the floor. And person after person came to the door and pounded on the door. You know, they have a, they had a luncheon prepared for us for after the ceremony. And they brought each one of the girls over to the door and my mother over to the door. Everyone was trying to coax me out of this bathroom. And I just couldn't come out of the bathroom. I, I don't know exactly why or what. I was completely in a survival mindset at that point. And I couldn't bring myself to even act. I was frozen in this this experience of it. And finally, I heard a gentleman's voice across the, the door. And it was one of the upstanding men of the community by the name of Wendell Nielsen. And it was someone that my family had known well in the Salt Lake area. And he, he was often seen as a kind and um, encouraging and funny individual in the community, but very, very well respected. And Warren had kind of hand selected him as one of his, um, one of his main helpers through this process of Warren taking over, and so he had been there at the same location, there to support Warren and to help the prophet. But he came to the door and he he asked me to come out. And once again, my years and years and years of culturing and conditioning, I succumbed to that patriarchal power in my life because I couldn't refuse to not open the door for him. I opened the door and he gathered me up and he's, you know, started to tell faith promoting stories and talk about it. And he said something to me that would really create something inside of me that would take years to, to come to fruition. And it showed me that Despite everything that happens, I do believe that spirit and that force that connects us all that's bigger than just us individually, it speaks even in the most horrendous environments. And he told me one day, he's like, you know, Sister Steed, because he called me Sister Steed at this point in time. And that's that was the crazy thing is, is that my mother was a Steed and now I was married into a Steed family. Yeah. And it shows how convoluted all the family trees are within the FLDS. But, you know, he said, one day you are going to sit and tell your story and thousands are going to listen. Hmm. And I know from his perspective, it was this faith promoting, this is all going to work out and you're going to be a shining example of how a righteous woman should be. And that was the, the feeling that was given to me. But I, I often look back on that moment and there's a part of me that wants to thank him for that moment because spirit was speaking and it was saying, keep going. This does matter. At some point in this string of events, this matters. And it's going to, to come forward and it is going to inspire. And it didn't happen the way that I'm sure he thought it would. But I look at it now and I, I value that moment because I've watched as in my, my journey, that has been what has happened is I've had the opportunity to share my story and, and have it impact thousands. In that moment, it was this pressure of once again, you have to step outside of yourself and sacrifice yourself for the greater good. And that would become the theme of my life as as things went on, we were driven from this hotel room back to um, Fred's home in Short Creek in Hilldale. And the whole family was there waiting for us. There was this welcoming party um, because three of Fred's daughters were married that day. And so there was a lot of people that were really happy that this had happened. Um, so they brought everyone out and everyone congratulated us and sang to us and took pictures. And, you know, I, I had these pictures of that 
that first time and, and you, you look at me in it and I have a couple of them in the book and I just seem dazed and absolutely checked out from the experience of what's happening. They had taken the bedroom that I had shared with my younger sisters. And that morning I had left that bedroom and it had been my child, my, it had been a child solace place, but they had under the direction of Fred, they had taken that room and cleaned it out. And that was now my wedding chambers. And the feeling of that, I now can articulate it, but in that moment I felt so betrayed because I was so frustrated that everyone knew how hard this was for me, but everyone is, was around me was, was doing this weird, like, Oh, you're going to be so happy. This is going to be so good. And it just, it wasn't happening like that. So there was this deep sense of just frustration and betrayal with the people around me. But when I look at the, what that, the reality of what that was to go from a childhood bedroom to a married couple's bedroom in one day, was really difficult for me. From that point forward, my life as I knew it really changed because I didn't belong to the unmarried girls and I didn't belong to the married women. And so I was this married girl who was really confused and really lost and so, so sad. I didn't really have anywhere to fit in my social groups, in my community anymore. And it started this this really intense process because I know that the man I was married to, he was really trying hard to do what he was told. And he, the way that he describes it is, is that he was doing everything in his power to get me to like him and to, to love him. It was hard for me because every time I would engage with him, I would have that same feeling that I had gotten before, that intuition that every single person has given, specifically women, when it comes to engaging with with men. We we sometimes we have these instincts and these intuitions and we when we ignore them, it usually comes with a lot of pain and a lot of struggle. And that kept coming up for me over and over. We were we were directed in hopes of trying to get us to fall in love with each other. Fred sent all of these newly married couples on this, this honeymoon. And it was this, this, this road trip that we all took in different places. And in my book, I really detail a lot of this time frame um, to try and give people a chance to see what it was really like. So it sounds like it wasn't like you have the traditional wedding night, the night you're married and you're now together. It sounds like, Maybe on some level they knew it wasn't right to be marrying a 14-year-old and they felt like they needed to give every you and him time to settle. Is that, and I'm not trying to pry, I'm just. I think that's a very good way to summarize it because that's very much what it was. And through that process, I had the pressure of the other couples as they were they were showing um, different kinds of affection towards one another and they, were, they would kiss and they would talk and I was so adamant. It was so bad that we were sitting in the same car and I was on one side of the car and Alan was on the other. And every time he would try to get me to engage, I was just blatantly almost to a point of rudeness. Do not touch me. I, you know, I was very adamant and I was so very, very clear on how I felt around it to such a point that even some of the other, the men who my sister is, my stepsister had been married to, you know, they would come to me and they'd say, you know, you could be a little kinder. You could, um, try a little harder. And so I was getting this intense social pressure from the people around me to, to keep, to, to, to go against my inner gut intuition and what it was telling me. And more so, I was so naive, so completely naive. And I, I explain it like this, you know, I was a 14 year old girl, but because of the culture of the FLDS, there is no education. There's no anatomy education. There is no sexual education. There's no education on what happens inside of the bedrooms to such a point that for a lot of the mothers, they are directed to not tell their girls about what's going to happen because the way that it's explained is the husband is going to educate the woman on those matters. And even though I didn't have all this education, there was something about it that I just couldn't 
imagine. And then it started to get to where the man that I was married to started to make these advances and approach me. And at night when we'd be sleeping, I'd wake up and he would be touching me. And it was just so difficult for me because it was, it was, it was like consistently being molested without knowing what was happening. But had this really weird, bizarre, because that's what was supposed to be happening to me. And everyone was telling me this is what's supposed to be happening, even though I had no idea what it was. And after- Were you his first wife? I was. And it almost sounds like the community was grooming you. To oh, absolutely. Be abused and molested, basically. Of course it was. Yeah. Absolutely, there was grooming. I look at it now, and when you, you call a spade a spade, and that's really what was happening, and, and why it's so important to highlight that part of the story is because grooming happens on- very conscious levels and very subconscious levels. And it's not just, um, it doesn't just happen inside of the FLDS. We see it happen in the Mormon church. We see it happen in other um, fundamentalist groups of this intense grooming that happens to the females to get them to do what they're supposed to do. And for me in this, uh, okay, I was forced to be married, but now I was being forced in so many ways to engage in these behaviors that I didn't conceive and understand what was happening to me uh, or what was going on because I really did not have an education around it. I didn't know that you had to have sex to have babies. I thought it just was what God did to you after you were married. Like, mm. It was that level of naive, naivety that was happening and, until finally this, this one night then... Um, we're sitting, I'm sitting with Alan and we're outside and we're looking at the stars and I, I am really trying at this point. I'm trying to listen to everyone's advice and that is just, just hold faith and do what you're told to do and ultimately you're going to love this person. And I was, I wanted it to work. I didn't want to be in this position I was where I felt so absolutely alone because I had nowhere to go that I felt like anyone understood what was happening and why I felt the way that I did, because it was very difficult for people to understand it. Even as I watched some of the other couples that had been married, I watched them kind of move on and move into this like cutesy little happy love that they were doing. And, and, and there was a part of me that wanted it. I wanted to feel what that felt like to, to be in love. And I wanted to feel at peace with what was happening what had happened to me. And so I kept praying and I kept doing everything that I was told to do to try and, and just be okay with what was already, I, I couldn't stop it. So I needed to change whatever I needed to change in myself. I wanted to change desperately so that I didn't have to be in this perpetual hell that I felt within myself. But I'm sitting there with, with Alan and it's, it's a peaceful moment finally between us because I was not quiet about explaining to him how I felt about the situation. And um, I turn and I look and, and he was exposing himself to me. And for me, I was still a child. I had never encountered anything like that. Nothing had prepared me for that. And it was so jolting and so abrasive to everything about me that the only response I could have was I yelped and I just jumped up and I ran and I ran as fast as I could, as hard as I could to my mother's room. And bizarrely, that was right next door to my room, who I shared with my husband. And I burrowed myself into my mom's bed, covered myself up, and just started to cry. What I look at now is, is that that was my response to this trauma that was happening. I was, I was still human, and my body and my mind and my consciousness was still responding to these things that were happening. And they were. They For, for me, that was abuse that was happening to me. That was traumatic experiences that were happening. And that's the response that was, was going on inside of me. But my mother came in and she was, what happened? And I couldn't tell her because I didn't know how to articulate what was happening. It just felt so wrong all the way around. And ultimately Alan came to the door and knocked on the door and just, you know, you know, Elisa, let me in. And I was adamant. No, I'm never going to go. No, like I don't, I don't want this. I was very adamant that I did not want that interaction, any kind of interaction. I didn't want to kiss him. I didn't want to hug him. And I definitely at this point in time, didn't even want to be in the same room as him because I didn't know what was going to happen. And for me, the act of seeing another man's body, especially his private parts was really jolting because they were snakes. 
and we weren't supposed to do that kind of stuff. Um, and it would take a couple of days for me to finally give in to the pressure and go back into my bedroom. And when I did finally go back in, Alan made it very, very clear that it was time for me to, to follow through with my marriage duties, that I was going to be a wife under every circumstance. And I could feel a shift in him where there had been a part of him where he was quite patient with me and he is quite careful of how much he pushed me into different things, but that all stopped. And it was very, very much, no, I am your priesthood head. You belong to me and you will do what I say. Um, and the climate changed completely. And I really didn't know how to handle it. And I, I really became a scared, trembling child. And I was like, please don't do this to me. As he started to explain to me what he was going to do. And he articulated it quite in detail of what was going to happen. And this was things that I was hearing for the very first time. And I was being told, this is what's going to happen to you right now. And I'm a child and I didn't have any, I didn't have any way of how to respond in the circumstances. And he proceeds to do exactly what he told me. And it was so so hard that even still, when I talk about it, sometimes to bring myself back to that moment, there's that feeling of what it felt like to be in the body of this happening. And he starts to undress me. And all the while he's talking to me about what's going to happen. And it was just one more layer of this horrible event that's unfolding in front of me. And there's nothing I can do to stop it. My mother is literally just a there's only a wall that separates us. And in my mind at this moment, I just wanted to go back to my mother's bed. I just wanted to go and crawl in her bed, put the covert covers over my head and have this end. But he lays me on the bed and I just freeze. I didn't have any response left. I didn't know what to say. I was just begging him to please don't do this. And it happens. And the very first time, I, I know a, a lot of people talk about how when a woman very first experiences any kind of sexual engagement, it's quite a painful process. But for me, it was viscerally painful. It was one of the most painful things I had ever experienced in my life. And so my body is experiencing this intense pain. And I, I, I almost started to just completely disassociate because I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to deal with what was going on. And, um, finally when it was over, I, I just laid there and I didn't know what to do. On one hand, my mind was numb and blank. And on the other hand, what was happening to my body, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding at this point in time and all of the things that were going on. And I, and Alan just rolls over and goes to sleep and I get up from this bedroom and I walk into this bathroom and I just, I sit there in absolute, just numb reaction. And at that point, it was the first time in my life where I wondered, would it be better to just take my own life? Because I, I couldn't, I couldn't do this. I, I, I didn't understand what was going on and I couldn't imagine it happening again because what he had told me is, is get used to this because this is going to happen often. And I couldn't imagine it happening ever again, let alone all the time. And so I did, I, I took a, a bottle of painkiller that was there and I just downed the whole thing because I was like, there is something has to, you know, something, I, I, can't, I can't do this. And even though for the people of the FLDS, the act of suicide is like the, it's right up there with murder and adultery because to take your own life, to escape your experience that God has directed you to be having is the worst sin and it is an instantaneous ticket to hell. But for me that it was okay. And as the, the, the night went on and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm trying to, to make sense of everything that happened, all of that patterning and that culturing started to kick in. And I was like, I can't do that. I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to hell. Like I, I can't. And so I sat there and I purged and purged for hours, trying to get it out, trying to get it out. Um, because I realized 
for me, I, I didn't a want to die really, and I just wanted this, what was going on for me to, to end to stop. Um, and the next day, or I can't remember it was exactly the next day, but I had a conversation with my mom shortly after it happened, because she could tell that I was something was not right, and she had brought me aside and just kind of trying to check in on me and see how she see how I was, and I started to kind of talk to her about it, and I was like, Mom can you tell me more of what's going on? And she immediately froze up and she's like, we don't talk about that. Alan's going to teach you about that. And so once again, there was a moment where I could have been given more information, but was kept in the dark. And once again, directed, you know, only he can teach you, only he can uh, do it. Um, and it created more separation between my mother and I. Ultimately, I had nowhere else to go. I was told that I couldn't spend time in my mother's room and I had gotten to a point with it where I just surrendered to the reality that this wasn't going to change. I wasn't willing to take my own life and so therefore I had to make it work and I created this delusion inside of my head. And I went through a season where I was like, this is going to work. And I did everything in my power to pretend. And that was the era of pretending. And I tried so hard to be the wife that I was supposed to be, to submit when I was supposed to submit. And as this started to happen more and more, you know, it wasn't until a few months after there was marital relations happening and Marital relations inside of the FLDS is how they refer to sex. They don't have words like sex or rape or abuse of that nature. That's not really talked about in, in those terms. You know, anything sex related is referred to as marital relations. But I finally had a midwife in the community who gathered me up. And I, I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was really confused. But she was the first person to ever explain to me the process of of having babies, of even my own anatomy. Like the first person that ever explained to me what a period was and what I was, what was supposed to be happening and how it was going to happen and how I was going to, it, it was this overwhelming amount of information where I was, and for me, what it did is it, it made me really question myself because I had been holding on to this idea that somehow what Alan was doing to me at the time was wrong and ultimately he was going to be told to stop, but to be told instead that, no, this is actually what you're supposed to do. And um, just, just that, to have this midwife educate me, but only educate me in the terms of preparing me for when I was going to have children. And to not hear it from my own mother but over time, this, this climate that I had within myself of trying to make it work, trying to be the submissive wife, it just, especially after the very first time that I engaged with, with sex actually, was the first time that I ever went back to Warren. Just recently after I, um, I had been abused the first time, then I was so convinced that it was wrong. And this was before the midwife had talked to me. Um, but I was like, okay, if I go and tell Warren what's happening, he's going to tell this, this needs to stop. And this meeting with Warren was really important because this is what, this is what ultimately led to the correlation that would convict Warren later on is that he was very aware of the details of what was happening within the arranged marriage that he had forced. But I went to Warren and I described in detail what had happened, the events leading up to what had happened, and then the actual act of what had happened. And I had gone there without Alan. And that was my first transgression in Warren's perspective is you don't show up in Warren's office without your husband. But I was there by myself and I was requesting a release. I was asking for this to end. And when he he listened and he heard it all and he got more and more agitated towards me until finally he stopped me in what I was saying and he just said, you are in the wrong. You go home and you submit yourself, mind, body, and soul. And he referenced that book, Enlightened Truth, that he had published of what a woman should and shouldn't do. And the book is 
is goes into great detail of what the what it means to submit as a woman. You know, what it means to submit your mind, body, and soul to a man. And so he pulled the book out and he gave it to me and he told me to go home and read it every single day and to follow the scripture fervently. So not only had I finally told someone what was happening, I had told the one force and power in my life that could have done something about it. And instead of doing anything about it, he sent me back and told me to act as though I was the property that I was to the man that they had married me to. That is what had kind of triggered this point where I went into this space of just trying to make it work, trying so hard to be the submissive wife. And I did. I went through several months of that, of, you know, yes, my, my response was, yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, husband. Yes, Alan. Whatever, whatever I'm supposed to do. And I started to become very del delusioned with this idea of what my life would look like as a submissive wife. You know, I would try and conjure up these images of what it would feel like to be a mother, what it would feel like to, to love Alan. And I was constantly programming myself of what this would be like because that's all I wanted. You know, I wasn't going to be let out. I wasn't going to be, none of it was going to be stopped. So therefore I just had to make peace with it and find my find my own way through through the process of it. But then the abuse started to get really bad, really quickly. And it, it knowing what I know now as a woman, there was a lot of things that were happening to me during that time frame that I don't think any woman should have to go through, but also especially if you are the wife of someone. I, I know that there's a lot of people that when they experience abuse, it's really easy for them to replicate that abuse to other people. And I've looked back on, in my effort to try and understand what was happening and where my cousin was coming from, I've wondered, you know, was there a pattern of abuse that then was just being dealt out? Because it was, it was this process of, of psychological abuse and sexual abuse and physical abuse where this event would happen where it would, you know, he would, he would make me watch him as he masturbated. And from the perspective of the FLDS, that's not something people did and people knew it. And so this, this would happen. And then he would reprimand me for being such a distraction to him that would make his body respond that way. It was my fault that this was happening to his body. And if I would just be more submissive, then this wouldn't happen. And it was this really weird time of, of all these different layers of, I was never the good one. It was layers and layers and layers of shame. And so I started to just find any coping mechanism I could possibly find of when I knew that when it was nighttime, this is what was going to happen. And then I became pregnant for the first time. And I how, was, how old were you? I was just, I had just turned 15. Yep. I had just turned 15 the very first time that I found out that I was pregnant. And at first I was really scared and wondered what this meant. It also meant that I was going to, to be, Alan's wife forever if, if I was going to have his children. And, and ultimately I, I, I had a miscarriage and because of some of the abuse that was happening, I look at it now and I can imagine my body was really trying to respond to what was going on. I also later found out that I have a unique aspect medical condition where I have negative blood and it creates a problem in when the partner is, has positive blood and the, the mother has negative blood, then there's, there's measures that the medical community takes now to try and prevent um, some of that from happening. That didn't, that wasn't a part of it because I hadn't told anyone yet that I was expecting. And when I lost the first child, then the layers of shame and absolute depression that I fell into because I once again was, was the problem. 
You know, it was my fault that I couldn't carry the child. It was because I was not a worthy woman. I was not a wor- I was not worthy to be a mother. And the years that would follow and to kind of encapsulate the relationship because this was also during a really pivotal point in the church, but the years that would that would follow, there was time after time that I would that, that little voice and that spirit inside of me would rise back up and say, something is not right. And I would once again go back to Warren or I'd go back to Fred and I would try and explain what was going on and that this felt wrong. This, this, something was not right. And constantly, once again, this, you are the problem, Elisa. You are the not submissive one. You are the one who needs to go back and pray and repent. And even though there was multiple miscarriages throughout that experience. It always layered the same thing that I was not worthy and I was not enough, no matter what I did to sacrifice, no matter how worthy I tried to become, I was not enough. And that was a theme that would take me years to untangle as a woman is to, to, to untangle myself from someone else's perspective of not enoughness to, to, find my own enoughness and to realize that even through the whole journey of it, then that spirit and that, that enoughness inside of me was really trying to, to be the one to communicate. For that, has the, a, that, that has a, when, when Jen mentioned thought stopping earlier, there's another term for what you just described, which is called blame reversal. Yes. When things are going great, the high demand religion takes credit. And, and when things don't go right, then mm-hmm. it's always pushed back on, on the members. They're the reason why things aren't going yes. well. Yeah. It was very much that way. The blame <laughs> reversal was, was happening on every level of my, my world. But I, for me, I was, in my, I was in my own little hell. That is the best way to explain it. But as a large, the community as, as a whole was also going through a major transition and hell of its, con- of its own. Because because Rulin would have died within this. I mean, either close to this time period or at this time period. Yes, Rulin would have died. Mm-hmm. Am I, do I have the time right? Or yeah, definitely. About a year and a half after I was married for the first time, m- married, then Rulin passed away, and and the Olympics would have happened. Yeah, right? the Olympics. So that that's the thing is <laughs> the Olympics came, and everyone waited. And waited. We waited for the end of the world. And even for me, I was a married woman at this point, and I was convinced that I was not going to be lifted up because I was being told that I was not worthy, that I was not a righteous enough wife. The Olympics came and went, and nothing happened. And there was there was this this feeling of like, oh, now what? But this is where Warren really stepped in with his narrative, and that is, is the Lord is granting you more time. There is a major test that is coming, and he's going to test his people. And it was this, this it's coming, it's coming, this test is coming, this test is coming. And this was just his gift. He's gifting you with more time. So the people then were like, oh, we need to fervently work harder. We need to be more pure. We need to be more righteous, more faithful because the Olympics happened and no distractions. And so why this was important is because 2002, um, winter of 2002, the Olympics happened and Roland Jeffs dies in the fall of 2002. <laughs> and this was not supposed to happen. We had long been subscribing to the narrative that Roland Jeffs would be redeemed and would be renewed. And what that meant was that for the people of the FLDS, that right in front of our eyes, what Roland was going to become a young man again, and that he was going to come, as soon as the people were faithful enough and righteous enough, then this process was going to happen, and he was going to come back and lead the people into Zion and father children with all of his wives. And so we believed in this. We would sing songs that were written around the prophet's renewal. And so much of this fervency around, you know, renew the prophet, the prophet will be renewed. We, we, will, we will redeem Zion. The time is short. The time is short. Well, on that fateful day in September, when we were told that Roland had died, I can't 
explain in words what that day felt like because it was so devastating. Of course, immediately it was the people's problem as we talk about this blame reversal and people weren't righteous enough. Yeah. Oh, and then this is the test. So the narrative that had been being told about a test coming, this was the test. And at first it was just kind of like this feeling of, of you out of body almost all these events are happening. And I remember even to the point where all the people are gathering into the short Creek area from Canada and all of the places and they are coming to this funeral and going into the church house and being dressed up. And we are all so, so sad because we didn't know what was going to happen. We, we had no idea what the future looked like at this point. And I remember seeing the casket and going through the viewing and, and looking at it and truly expecting Roland to sit up at any point in time and be renewed. Like, as long as we were righteous enough, that was what was going to happen. Even to the point that when they went to close the casket, there was a part of me that was just panicking because I'm like, no, like, if they close this and he's put into the ground, how is he going to get out? Like, that's how illogical the environment really was with everything. And, and I know from talking to a lot of people around this time frame, there were people that weren't quite that delusional about it. They were really like, okay, now what's going to happen? Because they were a lot more logical about the reality that people die and, um, I hear that a lot now that there were people that were far more skeptical at that time than they were willing to speak. But therein is that when good people do nothing, terrible things happen. And at this time frame, you know, I do wonder what would have happened if the people of the FLDS, some of these questioners would have been able to rise up in an effective way and say, slow down, wait a second here. Because the events that would unfold post Roland's passing were very strategically crafted by Warren. And looking back now, I see how he knew exactly what was happening. And there had been a part of him that had been crafting it all the way down to brainwashing Roland's wives that would ultimately marry Warren. Um, and after a couple of weeks of Roland passing, there was one pivotal meeting where the community had come together and Warren invited or called up one of Roland's wives, Naomi. And this was really kind of important because women were not called to the pulpit. I had very little memories of women ever being asked to speak in church. And so to have one of Roland's wives get up there, it, it was kind of a, a, a new thing. But she got up there with a message that if we really believed in Roland and we really loved our prophet, we would realize that Warren was the next prophet. He was the renewed version of Roland. And so it was this mashup oh. of ideas. And the years and years and years that Warren had been saying, I speak for my father, I am my father, all came to to convergence in this moment where War Roland is still with us. And it started with Warren saying, I feel my father. He's right here with us. He is inside of me. And that's really how Warren clinched that point of power was he himself had been saying it for a long time, but then he used other people that were very close to Roland to bring them in to convince the people that it happened different than we thought it would, but ultimately Warren was the, was the renewed version of his father. So therefore all the loyalty and all of the faithfulness that the people had in Ruland should immediately be transferred to Warren because he was his father reincarnate. Bizarre, I know. I look back and now I'm like, how did we fall for this? But Warren was the renewal. Just yeah. like, this is almost, this is like, this is stranger than fiction. It, it is really like, is its own stranger than fiction This is story. like a Twilight Zone kind of thing. And I'm yeah. thinking now, I'm sorry, Jen, I know you have a million thoughts, but I'm thinking now about <laughs> like every once in a while I'll run into a post-Mormon that's like, how can, how can smart Mormons still believe? I'm like, you don't, you have no idea what smart people can believe because oh, yes. what you're talking 
the level of devotion and the resilience of belief that you're talking about, mainstream Mormons have no idea. Oh, yes. What people are capable of believing. Well, that's what I tell people. Resilience is an interesting thing because it can happen for good and it can happen for evil. And in the same person, can I, I'm an example of that. Like my belief resilience in the face of all of these things that were happening in my life was incredible. I mean, lucky for me, ultimately I was able to transfer some of that resiliency into better ways of my life. But at the time, because you're right, like the ability for people to look outside of logic, but then also what happened during this time frame is, is Warren started to uh, very adamantly and publicly deal with people that had any question whatsoever. And this, we entered into an era where we really had no idea what was going to come over the pulpit. You know, there was one event one day where Warren came and this was at a point where there was a lot of question of who was a believer and who wasn't. And I later hear stories of there had been a priesthood meeting earlier that week or that day where there Warren had directed guards to stand at the doors of the church house. And there was a question that was asked every single man that came in. And what their answer was decided whether they could make they could go into this priesthood meeting. And the question was, do you believe in Warren as our prophet? And if someone did not say yes, they were not allowed entry into the priesthood meeting. And priesthood meeting is a meeting for just men inside of the Mormon religion. Um, and they were, they were kept notes. So all of the people who did not immediately absolutely say, yes, I believe in Warren as the, the new, you know, the, the, the prophet now were dealt with. And a couple of meetings after that, then Warren stood up and publicly and viciously excommunicated multiple men. All at the same time and explained that they were, you know, they were being led astray, that they had apostatized, their testimonies had been, um, their testimonies had been broken and that they were no longer, they were no longer members of the community and their families were taken away from them. It was so devastating because that was this moment where it radically changed the dynamic of the town. And if you look back on it now, it was anyone who had any question as to the power and authority of men of Warren. And not just that, it was also strategically removing individuals who had influence or respect within the community. So for instance, it was men who had been, who were much older than Warren, who had large polygamous families, but who were key individuals in establishing the community of Short Creek. They had built it from the ground up and they had given and supported people within the community. And, and Warren took a community that at one point had a lot of communal attributes. There was a lot of joy that happened within the community. You know, when I very first started to visit the Short Creek area, as a child, we would have community gatherings. There would be conference every year and the people from all over Canada and the United States that were, um, they would come and they would converge in the Short Creek area. And we would have this weekend of conference where there was work projects that all the community would come together and build more of the Short Creek area, build homes. You know, there's this famous um, video of the people of the FLDS. They built a house in a day. And this is one of those conference weekends where every people, every person came together with supplies and skill sets to be able to build this house in a day. It's phenomenal when you look at what the people were capable of and how they took care of their own and they took care of their community and they were incredibly self-reliant. But then there was also social gatherings such as dances and harvest festival and all of these, these things that were so much a part of the culture of the FLDS. And over time, Warren had very slowly taken those away completely. He had stopped dances several years before um, Roland's passing because that was his, his way of saying it was that was fraternizing. Girls and boys were fraternizing. And so the dances were stopped. And then any other social um, events were, were slowly stopped, even all the way to the point where there was, uh, there was this rich history 
within the community where we celebrated the 24th of July, Pioneer Day in Utah. And it was a really important day for the people of the community because it was a way for us to celebrate our heritage of pioneers and that we had come, we had all come from a long line of pioneers. And this was often celebrated with um, a parade through town that was incredible, but particularly the last couple of years before Warren ended the parade, was ended all social gatherings was there was these dancing girls and the girls would from all over in the community would come together and they would learn these dances of different kinds and then they would go through the parade and that was deemed as evil because that was showing off the bodies of women that was showing off um this 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 joy that was actually a distraction and he saw all of those social gatherings and the, the different ways that the community would come together as a distraction from fervent prayer and devotion to the will of the prophet. And so by being able to slowly weed out these things that were traditions and they were very much a part of generations of the community, it wasn't just um, the single generation, this this had been a part of the community since its inception in the Short Creek area and something that the people really looked forward to to such a point where by the time Warren had completely taken over, for most people, they were experiencing such an intense fear and there was no, there was really no joy. There was really no, nothing to look forward to other than this ominous, the end of the world is coming. That's I have to sacrifice and pray and give and give more and give more. And this also started a time frame where Warren started to to tell families, you know, if you are righteous, you will you will donate more. Every every priesthood head have a thousand dollars by the end of this weekend. And families would do everything in their power to follow those directives. After Warren finally clinched the power and was publicly removing any dissension whatsoever. And we, we saw, we saw lots of shedding of people, you know, mostly men, but some women were excommunicated and kicked out and families were just devastated. The experience that I had experienced a few years earlier of having my family taken away was now commonly shared by a lot of people in the community. And some of the women were married to Warren himself. Some of the women we were married to other men, but there was this reshuffling within it. But it was evidence to us that we, the women and children, were property of the church. And that was another shift that Warren really put into permanency is prior to Warren taking over, there was this idea that a man was the king of his family. He was the head of the household. He was the, the priesthood head. Warren changed it to where it was the women and the children belong to the priesthood. They belong to the church and they are just put under the guidance and the caretaking of this man. And why that's so important is because that was the tool he used to consistently be reshuffling the families. And it started an era of the FLDS families where you could have a woman that was remarried four to five times because she would be told that her husband was no longer worthy. She would be remarried and be married to that man until that man, um, for some unforeseeable reason, Warren decided he was no longer worthy and then she would be remarried to another one. And so we also saw this dynamic where there was a lot of children during that time frame who were born that really have no idea who their biological father is. And the reshuffling happened to where some of the trauma that, that came from all of that is there was a generation of youth and children who were so lost and confused of the structure of family and not really having a father figure and the layers of pain and trauma. It was like its own kind of, um, it was its own kind of trauma meal <laughs> that was happening to the community as a whole. But what it was consistently doing is it was putting people in a state of um, survival and a state of fight or flight to such a point that there was no capacity to question. <clears throat> and that was really how Warren solidified his power is he got people into a place where there wasn't even the capacity to question. And then you had the layers and layers and layers of religious indoctrination that was constantly backing that up and backing that up. Warren had also started to take his father's wife, his father's wives as his own wives. And my sisters had been married to Rulin. 
And so after Warren started to take over and marry those wives, my one sister in particular, Rebecca, I had been very, very close to her throughout my life and gotten quite a bit closer to her after I had been married. And she was one of the few people that I saw as a friend and we had a lot of shared um, experiences together. So I got a front row seat on her experience of losing her husband, Roland, and then the pressure that she started to be under to remarry. That would ultimately lead her to escape. And she has her own beautiful story of her journey in that process. But for me, the day that she left the FLDS was such a tragic, difficult day because I was, I was losing my best friend and the only person who had any way to help me and shelter me through the experience that I was having with this arranged marriage and forced marriage that I was in in this continual years of abuse that was happening. But I really felt for her soul because that act of her leaving was an immediate damnation. It also created a lot of really negative ripples in my life and my mother's life because we were taken aside after she had left because she had refused to get re remarried. That was part of it. She was not going to be remarried. And um, that was her only act of being able to save herself was to leave. And you didn't hear a lot of stories of women at that point in time leaving by themselves. But after her leaving, my mother and I were, were put on the hot seat because they felt like that we had contributed to, and in a lot of ways I had inadvertently and unconsciously contributed into what would ultimately be the tools that she needed to be able to leave. I'm so grateful for that now, but at the time I saw that as a, a form of betrayal because, mm. and it was so painful. It was so hard to once again, see another one of my family members who I would no longer ever be able to talk to. At this point in time, all of my mother's sons had left the church and um, all of them were apostates and we weren't, we didn't get to talk to them. We didn't get to, to take care of them, even to a point where she had her youngest son. He was, he was such a child, but at the age of 13, I believe he too was deemed unworthy. And ultimately she was told she couldn't, he couldn't be in her life anymore. And she completely abandoned her 14, 13 year old son. For the, a short period of time, he had stayed with my father, but ultimately he just kind of shuffled around. And by the time that Roland had passed away and, and all of this, I had become a bit of his mother and I was going against the grain of what we were told to do by not fraternizing with apostates. And I was doing the best I could to, per, to take care of him in the best way that I knew how. And he had been placed in the care and keeping of another couple who were trying to get back into the good graces of the church. And so it was this really weird dynamic within my own family, but just this continual splintering of the people that I loved the very most. But in that splintering process, it was constantly confirming and reaffirming to me that I had to sacrifice for my salvation. And as I watched my mother, you know, she endured some of the most horrific pain that a mother could endure. I, I can I can imagine it from her perspective now, and I cannot even comprehend what it must have been like to to abandon your motherly instincts and motherly duties so completely and watch it unfold in front of her. And her way of dealing with it was she would just become more fervent, more prayerful, and she would fast for months on end to try and change what was happening within her life and her children's life. And for me, I tried to follow in her footsteps of being submissive and being righteous in the very best way that we knew how to as women within the FLDS. With everything changing the way that it was within the church and the community of the Short Creek area, you know, men were being kicked out, families reorganized. It was chaos, really. That's It was a constant state of absolute chaos. And still we had Warren consistently talking of the end of the world. But then he started to talk about redeeming Zion and that people were going to be called to redeem Zion. And what most 
of the community had no idea of is that Warren had secretly um, started to establish another compound in Texas, in El Dorado, Texas. He had started to create this secret compound. And during this time frame, things got really secretive and bizarre within the FLDS. One of the things that Warren had done to um, further push the people was he had stopped um, marriages and he had stopped meetings. And the reason that he had given is because the people were so unrighteous and evil that the Lord was no longer going to gift them with these things. What we didn't realize is that was his way of starting this narrative that Short Creek was damned and the only redeemable people was whomever Warren himself handpicked to go redeem Zion. In El Dorado. In El Dorado. I mean, we didn't or know El Dorado, this. is they yeah, called it. El Dorado, in te- whatever they... In Texas. <laughs> in Texas, El Dorado. Um, so that, that's kind of a zoomed out perspective of what was happening at that time frame. But for the people in, you know, we would have this situation where a family would just poof overnight. We started to call them poofers because we had no idea of what was um, what was really happening. And what we knew is, is that the meetings that we were having, Warren wasn't actually showing up to these meetings, but he was pre-recording or he was calling over the phone and they were usually just intense doom and gloom. Like you would walk away from church and there would be no feeling of there would be nothing that would make you feel good. You would just feel absolutely horrible. Like somehow you were the, the, the reason all of these things were happening. And it was always very intense. And for me in my own personal life, I started to really unravel during this time because I couldn't keep pretending that I wanted to be married. I, you know, I'm turning 16 at this uh, 16 and, and into my 17th year, I'd had multiple miscarriages and the same thing was always, I was the problem. I was not good enough. I was not righteous enough. And I had gone to Warren multiple times, always begging for a release, always asking, I've done the very best I could. I understand that I'm not righteous enough. Please just give me a release, which is in essence a divorce. It's the only way to be separated from any kind of a marriage is the prophet has to sanction it and has to direct that it to happen. Every single time I would be directed to go back and try harder, be more submissive, do more, pray more, sacrifice more. And with Warren starting to disappear, he was a lot less present in our community so that I couldn't go on. I couldn't talk to him as much at this time frame and try and get him to help me with what was going on. But leading up to this, on several occasions, I had very detailed and clearly communicated to Warren what was happening and that the layers of abuse that were happening, both physical and sexual, were I, I was not in agreement with and I didn't feel like it was it was right that was happening. And I really started to real to realize that if I was going to take care of myself, it was going to be up to me. And I got multiple jobs from within the community. We weren't allowed to get jobs outside of the community because women it was frowned upon for women to work in general, but then for women to get any kind of a job outside of the community was an absolute no-no. And because the community of Short Creek at this time was pretty self-reliant, they had schools, um, they had uh, private schools because Warren had shut down the public schools at this point. Um, Shortly before the 2002, um, excuse me, shortly before the turn of the millennia, year 2000, Warren had gotten up one day and he had told all the people to remove their kids from from public school. And overnight, the, the public schools that were in the Short Creek area had been filled to the brim with kids and no one showed up. And what he did in turn is he instructed all of the people to start private schools. But if you zoom out and you look at it, it was Warren's tool of being able to remove any outside influence in the children's life. Because as he did with Alta Academy, he then distributed to all of the private schools the curriculum, the tapes and the programs that he wanted the kids to listen to. And 
um, surprise, surprise, all of them were Warren's work. They were all his recordings and his um, revelations and um, descriptions of the scriptures. Songs about him, right? Oh, it was always about him. And I realize that clearly now. At, at the time when this is all happening, we didn't see it that way. But it was always about him. So for the people of the FLDS at this pin, at this pivotal point, it's 2003, then Warren was not in the community very much. There was so much chaos of what was happening, but everyone was just overmaxed with stress and concern about the end of the world com coming. But then also all of these people kind of disappearing in the community, you know, a husband would be called to leave on a mission and just overnight would be gone for months on end. And his family would not be told what was happening. He wouldn't call in. He wouldn't talk to them. Um, and you hear some of the stories of what people were going through inside the community. And it's tragic. It's so sad to see what was happening to the people that were firm, fervent believers. But it was constantly pushing people to the edge, pushing people to the edge, seeing if people were going to break, how far they were willing to go to do what they were told to do. And um, within my own life, I started to separate myself as much as I could from my husband. I had had this time frame where I realized that I just couldn't, I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. And my sister who was married in Canada at one time was, was down for a visit and she had just recently had a young child and I really was not well. I wasn't physically well. I wasn't emotionally well. I was pregnant at the time, although I hadn't told anyone because I had stopped telling Alan or anyone that I was expecting because I knew that if I lost it, it would mean far more pain and struggle because I was once again going to be unworthy. So I always kind of just waited to see what, what was going to happen. But she invited me to come and see her. She's like, come up back up with me into in Canada and come stay with me. And this was kind of during a time where the split that was happening in the Canadian um, community was really becoming evident. And you were seeing families kind of separate based on their allegiance and where, you know, did you believe in Warren or did you believe in, in Winston? You know, that kind of thing that was happening. And she had surprisingly gotten an opportunity to go and see Warren. And I had already requested to Alan that I wanted to go up and spend time with her. But he's like, nope, you don't, you don't get to go. No, you're not leaving. You're not leaving me. You're going to stay here and you're going to continue to, to, do your, you, to do your wifely duties. And so I kind of went over his head and I went in with my sister to see Warren and just asked him if I could go up and spend time with my sister because I told him that I needed, a, I needed some time away to sort some things out for myself. And surprisingly, Warren said, okay. He was reluctant about it, but he had said, okay. And for me, this was this really, this was a relief that I had been praying for for quite some time. The ability to go and get away from the Short Creek area and get away from this marriage that I was trapped in. And I got the chance to go up and spend some time in Canada with my sister. Sisters, because I had a, two sisters that were married up there too. Um, to members. And during that time, then that's when I had a stillbirth because, and that was a very difficult time because I was not supposed to be in Canada and I hadn't alerted Alan to the fact that I was expecting. And so to have this very, very difficult thing happen, it was very scary um, to have it go the way that it was. And there was a point in it where I didn't know that I was going to live and I wasn't sad about it. When my body was going through that process of, of what happens when a woman is spontaneously miscarrying or a stillbirth is happening, it's still the same process. There's still all of the labor and the pain and the struggle that comes with it. And there was a point where I, I wondered if I was going to die. And I, I wondered if this was finally that, that thing that was going to take me, but also just this intense grief because once again, I, this was proof that I was a bad woman. I was a 
bad wife and I was not worthy. I wasn't even worthy to, to carry a child. And I realized in that moment, I wasn't going to go back after I came out of it. And I started to get strong again after that very near life, near death experience of that event happening. Then I just determined I was not going to go back and was not afraid to tell people that I told Alan that. And I ultimately told my mother that, and I told Fred that. And um, then they sent Alan to Canada to pick me up. And once again, you saw that, I saw that social pressure happen in my family because when, with Alan coming and me once again going into this, nope, don't touch me, don't even, and him promising it's going to be different. He's repented and he's not going to treat me the same way that it was. And there was all these promises that were being had about how it was going to be different. And ultimately, it became very clear to me that if I did not go back, the family that I was staying with, which was my sister's family, who had chosen to stay on the side of the split that was happening of believing in Warren, that they were running, that I was risking their their salvation. I was risking their status in the church. And they, it became very clear to me that, nope, I wasn't welcome there because I was too risky for them to try and and keep this going. And so I ultimately left and went with Alan. And immediately it started up again. You know, I, I detail it quite a bit in in my book of what that experience felt like to have had that moment of, of the light at the end of the tunnel that maybe this was this, I was going to be able to get away from it, but then to immediately just be sucked back into it and it just get worse because from that point forward, it, it got really physical because I was, I was older and I was a lot more, um, personally strong in my convictions of protecting myself. And that was when I started to just do whatever was necessary to take care of myself. And as time went on, I got multiple jobs and started just to be too busy because I realized that if I went home and I engaged in any kind of interaction with my husband, I knew what it would lead to. And I was no longer willing to be subject to that kind of abuse, even though my mind at that time time didn't have the language or the perspective to see it as abuse. I just knew how it made me feel. And I knew how painful it was and difficult it was and how much I didn't want it to such a point that I had started to sleep in my car. I would take my little truck that I had that I was given the opportunity to drive and I would drive out into the wilderness and I would pack up my things and I would sleep in there. And I had figured out this really great way to protect myself because if I worked all day long and, and as long as I possibly could into the night, then I could sneak into my house, gather a few things, go back into my car, go out into the desert and sleep and then be able to, to come back early in the morning after my husband was gone off to work. And so I figured out this rhythm of how to physically take steps to protect myself from what was happening. <clears throat> After I had left Canada and on our drive home, there was this there was this episode where it had become very, very apparent to me that nothing had changed. I was still expected to be a submissive wife. And once again, immediately after just promising days before that things had changed, that he was going to respect when I didn't want to engage, immediately it was um, this onslaught of sexual advances. And I, it just really solidified in my mind that I couldn't trust what he was saying. And I also was once again entrapped in what I thought I had gotten away from. That it would have been nice if Warren had given him another wife. That might have given you some relief. <laughs> possibly, yes. But that was part of it also is, is that because I was not performing the way that I was supposed to be, it was making it where he wasn't worthy enough to get another wife. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so it was a reflection on him. And it wasn't just mm. the way that he saw it. Everyone in our social circle of the community saw it that way. Because I was a representation of my husband. I was property of my husband, and therefore my actions were a representation of him. By the way, what I just said was awful because it would involve another woman 
being caught up in all this and that is, I just can't believe I just said that. So Agreed. I'm, just, I'm owning that. I can see, I appreciate that, but I can see, cause I've had a lot of people be like, well, maybe he could have just had a second wife. And that's an important point to make because this was the story of what happened to a lot of women. They were put in abusive situations and their only salvation from that abuse came from another woman coming onto the scene. And then that cycle would just transfer to the next woman. Right. And it's, 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 I appreciate your um, sensitivity in saying what you said, but I think it's an important thing to actually talk about. Whereas that was the reality. That wasn't just an insensitive thing to say. That was a reality. And I can't tell you how many times I thought the same thing where I'm like, oh my gosh, if I would, if he could just get someone else, then I can just go along my way and I'll, I'll be the. I'll be the, the shameful wife forever, and I'm okay with that, as, as long as this just ends. After returning from Canada back into the community and all of the chaos and the shifts and the changes that were happening in, in the area, in the Short Creek area, as well as Canada, you know, it put a lot of the community on edge. And in my realization, as well as more maturity, because I was finally 16, I had a an actual driver's license, even though I'd been driving and functioning as an adult since I was 14. And then I started to get a lot more personal defiance. And that's where I started to do whatever I needed to, to protect myself, um, driving out into the desert to sleep, working and coping. It was all about coping. And I entered my season of any coping mechanism I could find to be able to deal with the reality that I still found myself in, but not just within my marriage, but also within the community at large, because things were getting really scary and really hard. Um, there also came a point where Fred disappeared one day and that really affected my mother and my sisters that were still in Fred's home. He was your assigned dad. Yeah, he was, <clears throat> he was my assigned dad and he disappeared one day and no one knew, understood or why. He had like 20 wives in a household of a gazillion kids. Yes. But there again, that was, a, we learned later that part of the reason for that was that Fred disappeared was because Warren was removing anyone out of the community that had any influence. He didn't kick Fred out, but he told Fred to go on another mission and he brought him to a, an area in Colorado where he ultimately, that's where he passed away, was in Colorado in a hospital. But at the time when Fred just disappeared, it was very confusing to the people. But it was a way that the people no longer had anywhere to go besides Warren. And he was removing anyone out of the community that had any stewardship over the people that actually cared. Because he was constantly funneling people into this mindset where they were <sighs> blindly obeying out of desperation. And there was always one thing after another, where whether it was, you know, there's a test and everyone needs to fast and pray. And no one really knew what this test was to the next week. It was the Lord is asking for any the believers to, um, to donate their resources. And it was always asking for more money, more, more time, more fervency, more dedication. And it became really difficult for the people within the Short Creek area, because there was just no clarity of what was going on. At this and time, at this time, was Warren in Texas most of the time? Yes. Okay. We, we later found out that that's where he was. A majority of his time was either between Texas or also, we're not 100% sure, but that was a similar time where South Dakota, um, the compound up in South Dakota that was also established by Warren at the time. We don't know where he was bouncing. And if you read mm -hmm. a lot of the journals and the diaries that came from the Texas raid at this time, he, he would refer to all of these compounds and these secret hiding places with numbers. And he would talk about, you know, he went and he saw someone at R14 or he had quite a network of places to go. And that became very evident as time went on and he ended up running from the law because he had all of these resources. He had a multi-million dollar church and he had millions of dollars at his, re at his fingertips. I also don't think Warren had any con true conception of money because he'd grown up in royalty. And as time went on, he had been able to garner enough loyalty and authority that he could command a million dollars overnight, mm -hmm. truly. And the businesses of the community would 
would offer it and the people would offer it. And I once heard someone say, Warren does, Warren is someone from the FLDS that was talking about that their experiences because they had had a business inside and they had kind of seen how that worked. But they said, Warren didn't know the difference between $100,000 and a million dollars because it was all the same to him. Yeah. So it was definitely a difficult time for the people of the community because in a lot of ways, people were starving. They were starving um, spiritually. They were starving socially. Um, and he was constantly putting him in that state of survival because that I, I believe if you look at dictators and he had very much become a dictator at this point in time, then they use those tools to keep people in a state of control where it's easy to control them. Mm-hmm. And there was always this element of fear and concern because the end of the world was coming and you didn't know if you or your family was going to be taken away. You didn't know if you were going to be righteous enough or you going to get kicked out. Was something going to happen? And it only got worse. Even after I ran away from it, it only got worse. That climate of fear and desperation only got much worse for people as time went on. So... Um, for me though, this was 2003 to end of 2003, 2004. And then I finally had just reached a point where I realized that nothing was really going to change inside of my marriage and things were really going awry with my mother and her family because now Fred was no longer in the picture. I became a really important part in their lives because I was providing for them. I worked multiple jobs and instead of giving my money to my husband like I was supposed to, and I had been for many, many years, I was using the same resources and I was giving them to my mother to take care of her and my younger sisters. So I felt very responsible for them. And I believed that if anything were to happen to me, I wouldn't know what would happen to them. So it kind of reinvigorated my sense of purpose. And I started a season where I was very focused on taking care of my sisters and my mother. And because Fred wasn't there, it kind of started this, this, this season where I I was able to engage with my mother a lot more because Alan couldn't tell anyone. There was no one to really tell on me too, because Warren wasn't really in the picture very much and Fred wasn't in the picture very much. And so I ended up being able at a season where I got away with a lot of stuff when it came to not being a submissive wife. And I distanced myself further and further and further from my husband. There was one, the last time that I ever was abused by him, we had, I had gone with him because I was, you know, trying to have this shroud that I was still righteous enough, but we had gone up into this this area called Indian Box Canyon over in Short Creek area. And it's, it's away from the town a little bit. And at first I was, you know, I wondered if it was going to go okay, but ultimately throughout our discussions and these, these um, conversation that I was having with him, I aggravated him greatly and he got incredibly physical with me and just forced himself on me. And this, this was happening. And I was like, you promised you would never do this again to me. And it just in, angered him even more. After it was all done and over, I, this fiery part of me rose up and I just looked him in the eye and I said, you will never touch me again. And I meant it. And there was a part of this resolve inside of me that I didn't know where it came from, but it was like this, this fire inside of me that no matter how dormant it had become at different points in my journey, It was still very much there and it was these embers that were glowing that at points rose up and came alive. And this was one of them. But from that, that, that last time, then I had once again fallen pregnant. And a couple of months later, I had been working my way to just continue to distance myself. But one night I came back from work late and um, Alan's waiting for me. And there's the, we, we shared a, a home and, you know, I immediately just kind of was like, okay, 
I was accustomed him, accustomed to him being asleep by that point, but I came in and was very off putting, you know, but we hadn't really in, seen each other for quite a few, quite a few weeks and months. And I hadn't, I had done everything I could to never be in the same room as him because that was, that was my last resort. This is where I had arrived at in this experience was it, it had gotten so bad but it wasn't just the physical abuse, the amount of psychological, emotional um, gaslighting that was what would happen on an everyday basis where these things would happen, whether it was a physical altercation or I was getting hit or something of that nature. And then the very next day is it was completely, it, nothing happened like that. It was the worst form of gaslighting because nothing would happen. And we would go into these social settings with other people and, and I would be so off putting and, and, and frustrated at the way that I was being treated. But then everyone else just saw this veneer of this really kind individual, you know, and he would, he would put on this face to the world and whether he was a kind person or, or not, it didn't matter. The way that it showed up in my life was very much not that way. And maybe I just aggravated an alternate personality with him because that became a problem with a lot of the people is, is they would be the people in the short Creek area that knew us would get really frustrated because they couldn't understand why I was so mean to Alan. They couldn't understand why I was so off putting and why I, I hated him at this point in time because they didn't ever see that side. They didn't ever see what was happening behind closed doors. And when you put desperate people in desperate situations, terrible things happen. And that's what was very much my life was <clears throat> I was desperate. My cousin was desperate. And we were desperate for other reasons. I was desperate to protect myself. I was desperate to, to not be experiencing all of this. And he was desperate to be what he believed was a husband, a father, and a priesthood man at all costs. And whatever it took for him to break me, to get to where I would submit, it seemed to be that was the approach that was, that was happening. So I, I, I've tried really hard in my life since to, to zoom out of the day-to-day -day experiences. And, and even to this day, there's so much of the time where I have to compassionately work myself through some of this stuff because the gaslighting that happened through those years was so intense that I would often question my own sanity of, did that really happen? Like I, there's a bruise, I have a black eye, did that happen? And then when people would ask, then it was, of course, it's always this make up a story because I didn't know what to do with what was actually happening to me when it came to the different layers of abuse, but that's where the, the psychological part, you know, I, I tell people often in abusive situations, and I think anyone that suffers, that has experienced domestic abuse will tell you the physical element of abuse is one thing. And it's sometimes a lot easier for us to experience that level of abuse and um, be able to logically work through it. It's, the psychological and the emotional that is very challenging to work through. And that's been the hardest thing throughout my life to, to look back and unsort some of that emotional abuse because in a state of trauma, the things that are said, those little seeds that are put into you during that time frame, you're very susceptible to them because you don't have a filter to be able to filter out someone's bullshit version of who you are. And so much of that time from in my life was, it was constantly contributing to you're not good enough. You're a terrible person. You're not going to heaven. You're not this never enough, never worthy. And to this day, that's something that is going to forever be a lifelong sentence for me to get to unweave and to, to be to face and to be resilient to because it's, it's the stories. And I, I speak it because I think so many women that I have had the opportunity to listen to their stories, you know, when we detail the, um, the reality of what the, uh, the, the event that happened, whether it was sexual abuse or domestic abuse, the details and the experience of it sometimes are really easy to name. 
to talk about and to, to claim that shame as, as we feel. But what isn't easy to talk about is what it did to us on the inside and how it affects us for years to come after that. Because even though after the last time that ever I was ever sexually abused by, by Alan, I made a commitment to myself that he would never touch me. And that was something that I was willing to follow through with, with my life. Every single day, the years of abuse would touch me for years to come. And the nightmares and the, the flashbacks and the panic attacks and all the things that would come from it, you know, that, that was just the beginning. Getting myself physically safe was one piece and it's been a lifelong journey to get myself spiritually, emotionally, and subconsciously safe. In, within the broader context of the church at the time, it was getting more and more chaotic because you started to see more people disappearing. We did start to hear inklings that there was a Zion being built. We knew that somewhere there was a temple that was going to be built, and this meant that Zion was going to be redeemed. And so it kind of became a light at the end of the tunnel for some people because it was this idea that Maybe the destructions are going to be a little bit differently, and that's what's happening is that the destructions are still happening because any time there was an event that would happen in the outside world, whether it was a weather um, event, an uh, earthquake that happened somewhere in the world, or um, a mass shooting, or uh, like I remember <clears throat> 9-11, for the people that were in the church at the time during 9-11, that was confirmation. Oh, see, the, the, this is happening. This is how the wicked are destroyed. So Warren was using any event that would happen on the outside of the FLDS as confirmation as to his narrative that he was pushing and pursuing. But what was also happening is, is that families were, were being, that children were being handpicked out of families and they were being taken down into Texas. We didn't know exactly where they were being taken, but once again, Warren was using the model that he had used all along, and that is to influence the youth, to take the youth out. And we, we hear these stories of what some of these families went through when they would have their children chosen to be taken down to Texas. And on one hand, there was this, this reverence for that their children were so righteous that they were being chosen to, to go and redeem Zion. But there was also this intense grief and sadness of losing their children. And as time goes on and we start to hear more stories of the people of the FLDS, I think we'll see this time frame, and we'll, we'll see the stories come out of how this shaped the, the lives of so many people. It wasn't just the, the tragedy of Warren and what he did during this time. It was, the generations that would it would take to unweave and undo the trauma that would that came from this time period. For me personally, there was one day that I came home and and Alan had been there sitting, and we got into a, an argument. We got into a discussion about this was going to end. And as, as he was saying to me, you know, this this ends now. You are there. No more of this. Because of the, the fervency that was happening in the church every single day that you were not a righteous person, you were running the risk of not being called to Zion. You were running the risk. And f I can imagine for him every day that he didn't have the ability to command his wife and, and have obedience. It was, it was one mark against his worthiness. And it got into a very, very physical interaction. And I was adamant there was no way that he was going to ever touch me again sexually. And I was willing to do whatever was necessary, even if that was to, to scratch, claw, and get myself into a position to where he wasn't going to touch me. And ultimately, after a very physical altercation, I was able to run out of the, the home that we shared. And I just ran out with no shoes on and jumped in my car and just left. This was a cold November day, and I remember the snow was just starting to fall in the area. And all the years of, of it had just 
come up for me and I was so distraught and I didn't know where to go because I started to feel once again that what I assumed was a miscarriage all of the same things I'd kind of become accustomed to this feeling and I started my body started to react to it and I don't know if it was because of the physical um abuse that had just recently happened but I was full in the throes of it and so I knew I couldn't go talk to my mother I knew I couldn't go up there and I didn't know where to go and so I went to the only place See, every once in a while, the things come up that you don't expect. I went to the one and only place that I felt safe, which was the desert. And I'm driving out and I realized that I had hit something or something had happened and I had a flat tire. So I got out of my, my vehicle and I'm assessing the situation and I'm going through this experience of my body expelling <laughs> Um, this pregnancy that I had and it was it was just so overwhelming and so much I couldn't get all the pieces to change my tire I didn't have a coat on I didn't have what I needed and I'm, I'm sitting there and I see these lights drive up and I'm in the middle of the outskirts of the Short Creek area and instantaneously I was just immediately so panicked because I can't tell you how many times that I was picked up by the police of the Short Creek area and escorted home after they would find me out where I shouldn't have been. I can't tell you how many times that people would see me and they would tell on me of, you know, I was seen here and this is, you know, because one of the things that Warren had created is he created a climate of everyone was constantly keeping track of everyone else. And part of this reward system was if you could tell on someone, if you could turn someone in for what they were doing that wasn't obedient, then somehow it would give you brownie points. It was a weird dynamic and climate that had started to happen within the people. And it only got worse as time went on. So I was so panicked and I immediately was not even concerned with the situation that I had just left from or what was going on for myself. I was just concerned about not getting caught again. And... <clears throat> This, this gentleman gets out of the truck and I kind of see him because it's dark at this point in time and he, he comes up and he's like, do you need some help? And I immediately was like, no, 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 I, I'm good. I don't, I don't need any help. And, uh, you know, he obviously saw that there was something very, very wrong and he proceeded to help me change this tire. Yeah, he told me to get in the truck and warm up and he changed this tire. And this was one of those really important moments in all of it because the, the man that had come driven up that day was, um, would later become my escape partner and the father of my children that I would have later after leaving. But this moment was really important because he was able to assess that there was someone in, in need. And it was the first time that I had ever had anyone, especially another man, do anything to help me in a state of crisis. From that meeting, because at the time I was working in a restaurant that was inside of the community called Mark Twain, and he would come often to the restaurant for lunch. We often served a lot of the men that were working in the community, um, work projects, and provided a lot of food for people that were working. And I was a server, and working a lot at this restaurant. And through that process of, of connecting in that moment and the months that would follow, we started a friendship and ultimately I started to realize that I cared about this person and they cared about me. And for me, the experience of having someone care about me and not want anything else from me, they didn't want um, anything. They didn't, he didn't force himself on me. It was just such a new experience in my um, relating with the, the men of the community. And as we became more friends and we had shared experiences of, of our background, I learned a little bit more about him. But there was a question that would come up or he would ask me why I don't just leave. You know, if it was so bad and things were, were happening the way they were, why wouldn't I just leave? And I didn't have an answer for that because I wanted to. There was a part of me that really could imagine a life 
leaving and starting over somewhere, even if, even if it meant that I was damned to hell. But what really kept me there was my mother and my sisters. And I couldn't leave them. And we would get into some disagreements about, you know, he was ready to leave and he believed that he loved me and wanted me to just be able to, to, to leave and get out of it. And I can imagine it was very difficult for him, but I just wasn't in a place where I was emotionally or subconsciously able or ready to be able to leave. And for, for me, I was always, what's going to happen to my mother and my sisters if, if I do that? It all kind of came to a head because I had been more and more getting further and further distanced from the man that I was married to in the priesthood. And I was, I was having a friendship and we started to kind of fall in love with this other man that, and that was such a no, no. It was the absolute epitome of this most terrible sins, according to everyone else. But for me, it was just survival. And uh, it's hard for me to look at that time and say, you know, that was what I saw as a way out because I wasn't seeing it that as that. I was trying to do the very best with what I had in the situation. And I'm 17 years old. And I, I, I invite people to remember what they were like at 17, what the things they wanted and the things that were important to them. And for me, I had been married for three three plus years, I'd had multiple miscarriages. I had gone through some of the worst abuse that people should go through. <laughs> and I just wanted to be safe. That was my goal as a 17 year old. I wanted to feel like what it felt to be safe. And I, that was a foreign concept for me. The last time I ever ha saw Alan and heard from Warren was this one day after months had gone by of not seeing Alan, not checking in, because that was the thing is you always checked in with your priesthood head every day and every night you checked in and I wasn't doing that. <laughs> um, but my mother had reached out to me and she had come over to see me and I hadn't been able to see them for quite a little while because of... <sighs> all of the changes that were happening within the church and the community. And she just alerted me that, you know, the, I was being called into a meeting and she didn't know what it was about. And she hoped that it would, that it would go well and that she loved me and that she hoped that I knew that, that I was loved. And it was so good in that moment to get a chance to see my mother. And I was so happy to, because I wasn't allowed to go up to her place anymore. And they had walled in the Fred's home and made it its own kind of compound where there was gates and you had, there was cameras and you had to be given entrance into these places. So I hadn't had the opportunity to engage with my mother and my sisters nearly as much as I was accustomed to, even though I was doing everything I could to make sure that they had the financial resources to take care of themselves. Um, and later that day I was, I found myself sitting in a room with the acting bishop at the time who, um, was put there by Warren and Alan was in the room as well. And over the phone, then Warren was put on um, the line. And Alan proceeded to go into great detail of why he saw me as an adulterous woman and that I was fraternizing with apostates, that I had started a relationship and a friendship with another man and go into all of the, the detail of my transgressions of how I wasn't a submissive wife and all the things that I had done wrong and the ways that I had lost my testimony and from his perspective, everything that he saw is wrong. And I just kind of sat there the whole time and listened. It wasn't things, these weren't new things. These are things that I had been hearing for years of the same narrative of not enoughness, not worthy and never going to be worthy and going to hell and taking the people I love with me. <laughs> um, and finally, Warren, referring to me over the phone, just, just asked if these were true. And I didn't really respond. I mean, what do you say to some of that? And he took my silence as affirmation and just proceeded to tell me that I was an adulterous woman, that I had committed a cardinal sin. 
and finally, ever so finally, gave me what I had been asking for for years, and he released me from the marriage. But the way that he did this release was, it was, I'm so, you're so unworthy that you don't even get to be married anymore. And for me, listening to all of it, I was a little bit numb to it until this pivotal point in all of it, where even though I was, I was sad and I was crying and I didn't know what this meant for my life and, and for me, Warren referred to Alan in this and he said to him, a job well done. You are a worthy priest and man. And there was this, this moment you know, you know, you hear these stories of this, the jolt that happens and, and something just snaps inside of us and we see red. And immediately I was just so infuriated. And I was so angry and so sad because I could not conceive a God that would see that as a job well done. Like, it, it was so confusing to me. And he I, was your abuser. He was your rapist, right? For years. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand. Warren knew what was going on. He, he knew how I felt because I had told him so many times and I had been so vulnerable and honest with my feelings and how I felt about it. And, uh, to just have it backfire like that. And, and there was this moment where I'm like, this is, this is not a God that I want to be in heaven with. If this is what is considered righteous. And if this is what is a job well done, I, there is no hell that is worse than this one. And that was this final piece of, of it that gave me the, the push I needed to, to leave. And I was told that I was going to be a single angel. And the only way that I was, Warren went on to explain that for adultery, it's a cardinal sin. And that the only salvation for cardinal sins is blood atonement. And for the people in the FLDS, we knew we weren't, I, I didn't hear stories of it being practiced, but anyone that's familiar with the concept of it, it was talked about as this, this ritual that would take place within temples where when someone had sinned so greatly that the only form of repentance was this act of taking their own life in a ceremonial um, setting in exchange for their sin. And it was made very clear to me that I was damned and that was my only salvation. I was a single angel and I was being moved back into my father's home, my biological dad, who had all of these years been working so hard to find, to keep um, showing his repentance. And he had been allowed to move into the Short Creek area and continued to just give his money and give his time. Your and give dad him. remained faithful? He remained faithful. After all that? After all of that. For years, he remained faithful. And it shows, you talk about the resilience of a belief. And he had that resilience in the face of all of this adversity. He had this, this resilience in his belief system as to why he was still there and why he still subscribes to Warren. And, um, and just, He's living in Salt Lake. He has his... Three, he has his wives and children taken away from him. One wife stays with him. And he moves back closer to Hilldale. Hill, Hilldale? Yeah, to the to the Short Creek area. To Short Creek area mm -hmm. to just like wait to be redeemed yes, by Warren. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but that, came, that became a narrative for so many men that had their families taken away is they were like dogs on a chain. Meaning they got the scraps of whatever, and they when they when they said do, then they did and whatever it took for them to show their repentance, to work their way back into the good graces. But for for this particular thing, after all of this time of him not being my my father, and all of the years of the story of he's he's not a priest and man, I was put under his um, care, and the bishop loaded me up. I, at this point, was so emotional. And I remember walking away and, and Alan walks out and he didn't even say anything, didn't even pay attention to me. I was the dirt that he had always believed I was at that point. And it was, I was treated as, as such. And I was so utterly demoted and, and worthless 
in the eyes of this of the church leaders at this point in time. And I had just kind of given up on it. But he, the bishop drove me to my dad's house and dropped me off. And it was so hard because there was this moment where my dad answered his door and he saw me there and he didn't ask questions. He saw that I was really emotional. And the bishop said to him, Elise is going to be under your care. And he just took it in stride and he welcomed me in. And I, I haven't yet had a chance to really talk to my dad about that because it's still so raw for us both in a lot of ways. You but mean uh, today? Yes. As of today, you still haven't talked to your dad about that moment? Not in very good detail. And um, and she just understood where, where he was coming from at that time. Um, but they immediately put me in a room and just took it in stride, him and his wife, um, first wife. And there was a part of me that was very comforted by it. And I, I sat there and I imagined for a good hour after everybody else had gone to bed of what my life would look like if I stayed. With Alan? No, just stayed there in the FLDS, oh. stayed in my community. Oh. Because I knew my options at this point in time were I leave or I stay. And I imagined what my life was like if I stayed. And if I could draw from all the examples of the people that had been reprimanded as severely as I had just now, I was pretty sure it was going to be absolute hell because I would have zero social support. I would be used as example after an example forever after of what not to do. And it would be this constant shame wave after shame wave after shame wave. And even though I didn't have language to see it as shame, I, I knew that it would, I would be this, I would be held up as an example of what a single angel, what the realities of a single angel were. And I finally just, enough was enough. And I called the, the man who I had had a relationship with and friendship with, and I said, okay, it's time to go. And we packed up. I packed up the little things that I could and left. And I'll never forget that feeling of looking in the mirror as I'm sitting in the passenger seat, really not fully absorbing everything that had happened and driving away from Short Creek and seeing the lights as we drive onto the highway further and further away, seeing those lights get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and having this very intense feeling of uncertainty grip me. Because we had, I had no idea what I was driving into. I, I didn't know where we were going. I didn't, we didn't know what we would be doing. We didn't know how our lives would go, but I, was lucky enough to to know that some of my other siblings who had left that they had figured it out they hadn't been murdered or or raped or uh, or all the horrible things even though that's what had been happening to right, me right uh, the ex you know it was sanctioned by the church what what had happened to me was sanctioned by the church so it wasn't wrong that happening to somebody else was, was wrong on the outside. It, you know, it was an example of what could happen. And that was part of why I struggled so much with that, you know, a job well done statement is it felt like absolute hypocrisy. And even that version of me, that 18 year old version of me in that moment that felt that and experienced that I knew, I knew it was wrong all the way to my core. And that spark inside of me started to once again come alive because I believe that's where my voice started to say, you are not what they say. And it took years for that to, to come into a conscious reality for me. But in that moment, that's kind of when that first act of claiming myself began. In the months that would follow as we began to adapt into the outside world, it was new. And I often refer to the people that have left the FLDS, especially in the early days, we were like domestic refugees. I mean, we were coming in from a completely different world. We had different language, even though we all spoke English, the words meant different things. I had different perspective of how everything worked. And, and so many things were new and 
and scary and intense. And you know, I'll never forget the first time that I ever had like a face-to-face -face interaction with this beautiful and amazingly kind black woman. I was in a situation where we, we really needed, I needed some help and some support. And this, this, this was a, was the person that was behind the desk that was doing some of the work that I needed to get some help with. And what had you been taught about black people or had you been taught about? Black Absolutely. People? Um, Warren was an extreme racist and he was not quiet about the way that he would teach that to the people. Um, we had long elaborate stories of, of why, black people were, or any colored race, why they were colored the way they were. And that was the mark of Cain or the mark of, of, of all of their ancestry and what had happened um, it, to make them that way. But more so they were seen as subpar. And even though I never saw them as bad people, when you have that kind of programming your whole life, you really don't know what to do. And I remember this experience of, of seeing her and knowing that I needed to approach her and I needed to, some, some help and I didn't know how to and I really didn't know what to expect. But the experience, and, I, and this is where realizing the power of kindness, because I still tear up when I remember this because she was so kind and so warm and inviting. And it was at a point where I desperately needed some compassion because I was so afraid in this new world, trying so hard to adapt um, and to have a stranger who didn't know me treat me better than most of my own family and the people that I had known in my community was really, uh, it, was, it was very jolting because that's what started to make me question like, okay, that was completely different than what I had told it would be like. And um, she made me feel more human in that moment than most people had for, through my entire life. And that was a chink in this, um, this illusion that started to come apart at that point in time. I'm, I'm, I just have to note, there's an irony that you've mentioned at least two big chinks. One was when you went to Bear Lake and saw that happy mm -hmm. non FLDS family. And then this one with the first woman of color you'd ever met. You mentioned working at a, restaurant called Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. Mark Twain is famous for, for this quote. Have you, do you know the quote? I don't know if I do. Yeah. It, he said, travel is fatal to prejudice. And what he means is when you get outside your home territory and go and meet other groups of people, that's when you realize they're, they're just as good or better than you. So mm -hmm. it was, it was Mark Twain that, that kind of <laughs> Shared that quote and you were living it basically. Uh, in its in its way, absolutely <laughs> I was. I appreciate you sharing that quote because I haven't heard it quite like that. But it, it is the irony of all of the layers of the story. Sometimes it's, it is weirder than fiction, but it's incredibly interesting story. Even sometimes when I hear myself say it, I'm like, that, that was my life? Wow. <laughs> and was this the first black woman you'd ever talked to? In, in detail, yeah. yes, it was. Um, we had, you know, you see them and even though I never understood, but I, I didn't really even, I didn't know them or talk to them a lot, but also there were, there were no black FLDS members. No, there was no one of color in 20,000 people. Not and one. no, there was not one nor Hispanic. No, no, really? there was no other races, but white. Whoa. Yes. Not even Hispanic people. Um, I, okay, I kind of take that back. There was there was one particular family that <sighs> that had um, some indigenous um, native blood in their background, and there was always a story spun as to why they were. But that was the only people of any particular race other than than the pure white people, as they were. You know that that was God's pure people, and. Once again, Warren taking the notes from other dictators, if you can create this idea that you are better than someone else based on skin color, it gave him power in some way. And for a lot of people that have left the FLDS, that's something that we have to transcend is the innate racism that was built into us without our knowing, without our conscious understanding, because we didn't have any other reference point 
to go with. But it's also one of those really incredible experiences because once you can confront that and you can assess it and say, no, actually, I don't believe that. I don't believe they're, they're less, they're just like me. It's a really powerful experience to then be able to continue to unweave that dogma and bullshit that came with the way we were cultured. It's beautiful. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you're so quiet. I'm like, oh, I'm the only one over here talking. I mean, we could you do we have a million questions. Yeah. And there's a million things we could say, but this is so good. We just, yeah. wanna, we just, you're, and you're a great storyteller. So. Well, thank yeah, you. you I, it, there's, there's great power in telling the story. And that's where I'm at in my life is the opportunity to come and tell this story. Um, this is, is new for me because most of my storytelling has, you know, it was written in the book, but even that you have to condense it because a reader wants to be able to finish the story. Mm -hmm. And, um, even in my appearances, such as like Oprah and, um, all of the other things that would happen, it was never a platform to really go into the depth of the story and to, to do that today is really profound for me because I, I get to weave it all together for, for myself, because really that's part of what this experience is for me is I'm claiming it for myself and reclaiming my story, reclaiming the journey that I've, I've walked in hopes that by sharing it with the listeners as well as in propelling me forward into continuing to share the story because even what we've talked about to, to this point, it's, it's been shared on, on some level, it's been told. And as we move into the next part of this, this journey together, it's areas that I haven't spoken of what life was really like in, in trying to adapt into the world. And that's really where we were. I, I started out with my, my firstborn son, at this point and immediately all the shame voices came up you know it was don't get too excited because you know this is not going to last you're you all those same voices even though i had removed myself from the environment of the flds and and all of that i hadn't removed my psychological i was still entrapped with the psychological um shackles that were the belief system that i was coming from and part of my coping mechanism to this point was to just out of sight, out of mind. I didn't talk about what my life had been like. I didn't talk to anyone about the abuse that had been happening. I had, after I left, I had the opportunity to reconnect with my sister, Rebecca, and some of my other family members who had been out for a little while. And to see their their journey and to see where they were, my, my sister had a, a new and a young boy, and her and her husband at the time they were they were working and they were thriving in the best way that they knew how, and it brought me a sense of hope. Where were they? They they lived in Coos Bay, Oregon, at the time that I left, mm. and um, so I left later in the year, um, in the fall, and the first Christmas that I ever of what year. This was 2004. Okay. Yep. 2004 Christmas. And then I got an opportunity to go up to Coos Bay where my sister and my two of my brothers were living. Actually, three of my brothers were living at the time. And um, experienced Christmas for the first time. What does that mean? Because we don't, we didn't celebrate any of those things in the FLDS. No Christmas. No Christmas. Um, no Easter. They celebrate um, more of it as that's when they usually do their conferences right around Easter. Uh, they don't celebrate a lot of traditional holidays, and the only one that they really paid any kind of reference to was the Fourth of July. But that was more of just the Lord is blessing us that we live in such a free country because. That allows us the freedom of religion. And the only reason why, this was the weird part, the only reason why America existed was for the the, the Lord to have his people here. You know, that's how narcissistic the whole so situation they could was. Polygamy. Yep. So they like could America was created so the polygamy could thrive. Yes. It's also weird that <clears throat> two the two ultimate Christian holidays were not celebrated in a supposedly Christian church that Bears the name of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. but it. But if Warren, if it was, if it was all about Warren, even Jesus wasn't wasn't was, was a threat <laughs> for Warren. Even Jesus might be a threat. Maybe. Well, and they also would say things like that. Um, those those holidays were a perversion of Christ. Mm. 
that was the the evil world um, perverting the story of Christ and mm. what he was here to do. Um, I'm, I'm not all I'm not sure all the reasons why they didn't observe those holidays at all. But even the story of Christ, that wasn't so much um, present. It was the story of Joseph. That was the ever present story was Joseph. And he was, you know, the, 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 the Holy Ghost in all of it, you know, because you had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the way we were told is Joseph Smith was that Holy Ghost mm. in that, that trinity of weirdness. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that first Christmas, getting the experience of what the rest of the world was accustomed to, to feeling of family coming together. And even though I was removed from the day-to-day -day chaos and the, the struggle of what life had been like in the FLDS, and physically I was safe, my body was going through a, a intense post-traumatic stress. And it was very difficult for me to, to create connection with people. It was very hard for me to, um, to speak to talk to strangers or to be able to, to function really in the outside world. Cause, and I didn't, I didn't have language and I didn't know what was really going on. I hadn't sought therapy at this point in time because that's done. We were still in survival. We were just trying to survive and adapt. Uh, but after getting to sit with my sister and I remember decorating my very first Christmas tree and the experience of putting the lights on the tree and even though we were, we there had very little because they were struggling to survive, and we were, they were um, working in minimum wage jobs, and doing the very best they could to to start their lives over. Just the experience of being able to do what everybody else was doing and feel normal. That was the gift that that moment gave me was what it felt like to belong, to the larger scape of the world because we were experiencing this shared holiday of Christmas and what it meant. And it was cozy and it was beautiful and people were coming together and there was gift giving. And, and it was this experience that I hadn't had in my childhood for a very long, long time. And I will always remember that first Christmas because it was the first time that I realized I had done the right thing for myself. Even though at this point I'm expecting my my son and I'm getting further along in my pregnancy and I am, I'm realizing that I'm going to probably keep this, this child. And now I had the purpose of, of him. I, I, I didn't know it was a him yet, but I knew that whatever this, this child that I was I had in my womb at this moment, that they deserved more and that I had to keep, I had to stay alive and I had to keep going because I had a purpose, you know, inside of the FLDS, I had a purpose and it was my younger sisters and my mother. And after leaving the FLDS, my purpose then was my, my child. And also, I really was concerned for my mother and my sisters. And right around the same time that I was in Coos Bay with my sister, then my mother and younger sisters disappeared. And we had had some quiet... Um, secret communications with, with my mother. And I still had been able to call her from time to time and just check on her and let her know that I was safe. And we all knew that her keeping tabs on us and us being able to keep tabs on her was definitely a no, no. And there was concern whether they were the home that she was living in was tapping the phone lines. And this was all pre cell phones. Like from, for most people, this was pre-cell phones. And so there wasn't just a way to like get her a burner phone or, or talk about it like that. It was, it was still very much, she had a landline and whether it was being tapped or not, we, we don't really know exactly what had created it, but overnight she was gone. And with my sister and I, we started to talk about it. You know, there was a lot of concern and my, my brothers were involved in these discussions of what are we going to do? because this, we can't just do nothing. You know, there was a lot of concern around it. And I went 
and talked to the people that I could all the way even to the bishop, calling the bishop and asking about them and getting told they are on the Lord's, they're doing the Lord's work. They're on a mission. And I, I couldn't sit with that. And neither could my sister. We couldn't just sit and do nothing about it. So around the, the next, the next year I had my son in February and it was such a, and, and just to be clear, this is a son with, with your second husband. Yes. Not with yeah. your first. Not with so, my first. So mm -hmm. blood wise, you were able to have a, because his blood type is different than. Yes. But your, also I had sought medical care <clears throat> oh. um, throughout this particular pregnancy and they had immediately taken measures to medically treat the problem that comes up for women that end up having negative blood. I'd gotten multiple infusions and shots to counterbalance. Uh, it's like an RH factor that happens in pregnancy and it was also an, an important thing for me because I get emotional talking about it, but I'll, I'll always remember the beautiful um, doctor who had helped me when I was pregnant with my son because she was the first person that helped me to realize that what had happened with all of those past miscarriages could possibly have been other than me being an evil, horrible individual. And it opened up a whole different part of it because it was like, actually there's something about your body that was making this happen. And that's where we took extra precautions and extra measures to make sure that I, my body didn't spontaneously abort this pregnancy. Um, because we were able to, I was able to get the help that I needed and I probably should have had in all of the other, the, all of the other pregnancies that I had had to that point. But when you, you unlearn that you were Wicked, and that was the reason why all the babies had passed away. Yeah, it was the first chink in the same thing. This illusion that had been that had been pushed on me about it being I'm the problem. To there was more to the story than that. That's where more information can really bring a lot more compassion, because it started to help me get a little bit more compassionate with myself, um, and that unlearning that I had to do around the the things that I had been taught and forced to believe for so long about myself and about my journey. Do you have an idea how many total pregnancies you lost? About five. I, and it's, it's a, but I had four miscarriages and a stillbirth. Um, and I know that there's later on with it, that became a point of like huge, like, Oh, she's lying because in the process of, of trial, when all of those details and those nuances are being used as, as ways, you know, there was so much during that time that I was trying to figure out. And even the act of going into the doctor was a huge learning experience for me. The act of filling out medical records and trying to go back and, and, and remember what was going on during different times. Like it, I, I was just trying to give them enough medical history to, to help me. I wasn't trying to put into evidence something, but those were kind of the things that I would later learn were a huge issue because they weren't always factual. And as anyone who goes into any medical records, they just have you fill out some information and then it goes into your records. And it's not like you're constantly um, keeping track of exactly what you say. It's just trying to give them the best amount of information to, to help you. Um, but when you really put that in context, I was 18 years old. I had just given birth to my son, which was my sixth pregnancy. And I was a new mom in a brand new world. That was really scary. And I had none of the network or family structure that we were accustomed to. I had my, my siblings that had they had left and we bonded together in this effort to try and help each other out, you know, my sister had come down when I had gone into labor with my son and she had been the one and found the only family member that had, that had been there for me through that process. And I will forever be so grateful to her for that because it was a very hard time of my life because I was completely shutting off the realities of everything that had happened to me. And I still hadn't told people the levels of 
things that had happened and how severe it really had gotten. Even though my sister knew some of the stuff that had happened, she didn't know in detail everything that happened. And the man that I was now with, it was really, how do you articulate layers and layers of abuse that you had experienced without it complicating your relationship? And I'm a new mother and I start in this process of severe postpartum depression because I didn't have my own mother and we didn't know where they were because they were gone. And I felt all the layers of shame and guilt and everything starting to come up. And it got harder and harder and harder to ignore and to shut out what was what was going on. And I started to recluse further and further, further into my shell because I didn't have the tools to help myself. And the depression and anxiety was getting so incredibly severe. And, and here I was, I was, un, I was trying to, to raise my son. I was, I was trying to, to adapt into this world and figure out who I was and what I was and how we were going to survive and where we were going to live. And we were bouncing around as we were trying to navigate this new world. I'm trying to learn how to dress and learn how to, to be normal and not feel like a freak because you don't know anything. And you know, you go into social settings and people reference movies and you have no idea what they're talking about or um, all of the social that people grow up with and the cultural references and the, the culture of American society, that was lost on me. And we had to learn all of these things, sometimes in a mass feeding and sometimes it was ever so slow of this, of this process. But for, for people that are assimilating that come from these kind of secular, very secluded, religious sex, it's a process and everybody's experience is vastly different, but there's some common threads and that is everyone needs to learn how to survive. And most of us are uneducated and we don't have a lot of tools on how to survive, a very little concept of money and, and how to manage it, how to work for it and be paid for it. Because a lot of people, they have incredible work ethic, but the skill sets were all in construction for the men. And then how do you correlate that into making a living? And so for, for me, I was just trying to adapt as quickly as I could, but also to do everything that I could to not feel like I was broken, but on the inside, I was absolutely broken. For the people of the FLDS, the little that we did hear of what was going on, we realized it was getting crazier and crazier. Um, we would hear stories of some of the things that Warren was asking the people to do. Um, we, we started to learn more and more of what was happening in El Dorado in the compound in Texas. And there was a lot of concern of, of what was happening and, and how far and, and crazy it was getting. We knew that there was a lot of people that were being moved down there. We knew that, um, so many resources and so much money was being funneled out of the short, short Creek area and just poured into all of these other spaces. But as time went on with my mother and my sisters, it became very apparent that something had to be done. And my sister and brother, they filed a missing persons report on my mother and sisters. Shortly after my son was born, then Fred Jessup passed away. And my sister had filed this, this missing persons report and had started to try to see what we could do to get other people involved, potentially authorities involved, to just find them and, and to do a well, well checkup on them and make sure they were well. And my mother reached out one day and um, let us know, just out of the blue, that she was going to be in town for Fred's funeral and that we were invited to come to Fred's funeral and see her. But it was also her way of trying to get us to clean up the missing persons report that was there. I remember driving back into Short Creek, and this was the first time I had been back um, since I had left. And the feeling of it was it took everything I had to stay calm because this the PTSD that was coming up driving back into Short Creek was so massive. And I, I can't, it's so many times I would, it took everything I had to stave off a panic attack and even having more than one 
because I only wanted to go in there and I wanted the opportunity to just see my mom. I wanted her to meet my son and I wanted her to know that I was okay and I wanted to know she was okay. And I was very hopeful that we were going to get to see my young sisters from this. And from that, I wanted them to know that I was okay. And my mom had, we, we did get a chance to see her. And even at the park, it, it was so fascinating because at the time there was this park in the middle of Short Creek called Cottonwood Park. And it's very iconic because there's these giant, beautiful, old growth cottonwoods that are huge. Some of the biggest cottonwood trees you'll ever encounter. And for so much of the history of the Short Creek area, it's a really important area because that's where people would gather for all kinds of community events. And that's where she had invited us to come and see her. And so I did. I got the chance to go to this, this place of my childhood and see my mom and, and hug her and just, just hold on to her and introduce my son to her. And I remember she was so much my loving, kind mother, but she was very adamant with her message. And that is, if you love me, you will not fight the priesthood. And just expanding on this rhetoric of what it means for a mother's children to apostatize, but then also to try and do anything to stop the priesthood, the work of the Lord. And just making it very clear to me that if I was going to continue, she was, she was happy that I was okay. And she was very happy that I was out of my, the, I was out of the relationship with Alan and I was no longer going through what I was going through with that. And she was really happy for me that I was a mother now. And she invited me and encouraged me to just focus on my new life and forget about everything that had happened and just go be well. And there was a part of me that, that just wanted to do just that, to just go be well. And I wanted still to just be a good child. And I remember even just saying at the time, you know, mom, I'm not, I'm not going to fight the priesthood. I, I love you. I want, I want you to be I want you to go to heaven. I want you to have a salvation and I want the girls to be okay. Just, just don't let them get married. Don't, don't let this happen to them. And she invited us to come to Fred's funeral because my sister was very adamant that mom, how are you going to stop this from happening to the girls? Cause that was the whole point. She wanted, she wanted Rebecca to, um, close out the missing persons report that had been filed. And she wanted them to just let us let, let that die so that they, we just knew that they were okay, but we needed proof. And so mom invited us to Fred's funeral to, to show proof that things had changed. When my sister and I go to go into Fred's um, funeral, the man at the door, um, his name was Willie Jessup of all people who he was he was known as kind of the henchman of the FLDS. He did all the dirty work for um, Warren. And we saw that a lot later on as time went on. Um, but he just completely stopped us from going in. And um, we explained to, that, to them that the, the, the bishop had told us that we could come into this funeral. But see, that is a practice of more of the abuse that happens with the FLDS is when someone leaves, they don't even get to go and attend the funerals of their loved ones that are still in the FLDS. And there's this immediate separation that happens and there's nothing you can do to, to change that. <clears throat> but it was the proof that my sister was pointing out that nothing had changed. And when we later talked to my mom, then she's like, you know, there must have been a mistake. And I remember we waited outside the church house the entire funeral and a couple of hours long. And then there's a point where the church house in Short Creek is within walking distance of the graveyard. And usually what was traditional was people would leave the church house after the funeral and everyone would walk to the graveside where they would do the burial. And that was just kind of part of the tradition of um, funerals and burying our loved ones. So we waited until they 
we're walking up to the graveyard and the experience of walking alongside all of these people, all these women in dresses and knowing so viscerally that we were, we were so treated as apostates. No one would look us in the eye. No one would say hello. And we were, there was this great bubble around my sister and I, because we were walking with everyone to the graveside, but no one was engaging with us whatsoever. And it was very bizarre to be in our community with our people, but be so not in it, not even be acknowledged as there. That experience, oh, go ahead. And just to be clear, this is, from their perspective, this is your own dad. Yes, right? yes. You're being kept from the funeral of, from their perspective, your own dad. Yes. <clears throat> that had been assigned. And you're being shunned so at severely your dad's shunned. funeral. Mm -hmm. So your, but from their perspective, your dad died mm -hmm. because he was reassigned as your dad. Mm -hmm. And then they're shunning you at your own dad's funeral. And severely shunning us. But I remember just thinking, hold your head high, hold your shoulders high, and just keep on walking, keep on being, because you're here to be an example. And, you know, looking at people that I had known my whole entire life through there and through the, the FLDS and not even being acknowledged was very disconcerting and in its own way, its own kind of trauma. But from that event, really, it was the final piece that was needed to to help me realize that something had to be done. And even though my mother had begged me and made me promise that I would never um, stand up against the, the, the priesthood, I started to really question what we were going to do. And, and finally came to a place where I realized that I had to do something. I didn't know what that meant, and I had no idea what would happen from that day forward. But I'll never forget the day that I finally made the phone call to an individual who had been trying to reach out to me. Um, his name was Roger Hool, and he was an attorney in the Salt Lake area that had been privately hired by an ex-FLDS member by the name of Dan Fisher. And Dan Fisher had left the church many years before, and he had been a huge tool of trying to support and help people that were leaving, particularly during the season of what was called the Lost Boys. And it was a time where a lot of young boys were being kicked out of the FLDS and sent, you know, to just fend for themselves. And, and Dan Fisher was collecting these boys, putting them through school, trying to help them find jobs, and was a huge benefactor in, in helping so many people be able to come out of the FLDS and adapt into the outside world. But one of the things that had become kind of a focus for not just Dan Fisher and Roger Hull, but also um, the investigators in the state of Utah. You know, the uh, the name just escaped me. The the head uh, prosecuting attorney, Attorney General. Thank you. <laughs> the Attorney General of Utah at the time was starting to talk about. You know, there were some things that needed to be investigated. They were concerned about what they were hearing was happening in the FLDS, and. Um, I realized that I had this concern that if I didn't tell my story, that I would be subpoenaed to tell my story. And so my act of calling this attorney, because he had been reaching out, he had been reaching out to the man that I was with and just asking if they could talk to me. They, they had heard some things and they wanted to know, um, but they wanted to know my story. And I remember finally just being brave and just calling him up and saying, you know, I, I remember hearing this man answer and um, asking, you know, is this Roger Hool? And I was like, yes. I was like, this is Elisa Wall. And if you want to talk to me, if you want to hear my story, then talk to me. <laughs> I, I, I hear from his side of it now, but that, that, that meeting, even though it was over the phone, would change everything for me. Because Roger Hool became my personal attorney and he was such an important person in the events that would unfold in me being able to come forward and tell my story. And I'm like on the edge of my seat, excited <laughs> to hear what goes next, but we're, <clears throat> we're probably at a point where we should, where we should wrap this segment down so that we can start the next one. So it's going to be a bit of a cliffhanger 
because um, while while this episode's ending, we're going to start right back up soon and tell the next part of the story. So we've we've made it through to your escaping and having the resolution to to do something about it. And so that concludes this part of these two parts. And and we're just all so excited to hear what comes next, which is, I mean, there's two major parts. It's how you how you engaged in the fight to bring Warren Jeffs to justice and to transform the FLDS community. And that's going to be its own journey. Who knows how how many hours that's going to be. And then there's still like life after being the hero, which has its own. Yes, it does. Has its own set of stories and what you're doing now. So like what we're six, six, seven hours in and we've only just begun. How weird is that, Jen? <laughs> or how normal is that? I know. In normal, I was going to say normal, but not. <laughs> but not. We still have a lot to come. Yeah. Still have a lot to hear. I'm yeah. Excited. Like, Elisa, what an amazing story so yeah. far. Like, you've shared so much. Not only so raw and vulnerable, but just so incredibly thoughtful and wise. Yeah. Like, I liked what you were saying. I think it was at a break. But, like, distance from the story allows you to tell it in ways you maybe couldn't have told it five or 10 or 15 years ago. So this is so moving and I'm seeing so many connections with Mormonism. Yeah, me too. Just a million connections with Orthodox more, you know, normal traditional LDS Mormonism. So I'm, I'm no, my, our viewers and listeners are feeling the same way. Well, thank you. I'm, I look forward to getting to share the next chapter of the story and and invite all of the listeners to come back because you know that that's one f chapter of it and it has all of its own um it has its depth and its richness and its and its tragedy with it but what we can talk about as in our in our next episode that that's where the real human journey began and i'm excited to get to share that yeah so come right back for part depending on how we chop this up part two or part three <laughs> of our amazing epic interview with Elisa Wall <clears throat> and her amazing book. Show that book, Stolen Innocence. Yes, Stolen Innocence. Uh, this this is the kind of details some of what we've covered over these, these episodes, this episode or episodes. And um, we've kind of come to a point in it where now we'll, we'll go into detail with, with more of it. Yeah. And then hopefully talk about what happened after the book was published so thanks everyone for tuning in to mormon stories and stay tuned for the next part of this interview thanks everybody thanks jen thank you thanks everybody <laughs>